Trisha Gleason, Assistant City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held, I'm sorry, hereby directed to call a, de a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, September 18th, 2023, 6.30 p.m. in the historic Fed Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for September 18th, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio or written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input during the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access codes that appear on the broadcast and live stream and are posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must include the name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance at tonight's meeting is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you, Mayor Cavanaugh. I'll turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Trish. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Well, before we officially get started tonight, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, this is a standing room only situation, so welcome to the meeting. Glad you're here. Um, we do want to start on a more sober note, though. Um, this week, we, we lost a member of the city council family. You may have heard that Joyce Connors, who served this council for 16 years, died this week. Um, we'll be celebrating her life this week as well, but we want to make sure that we take a moment, uh, we all agreed as a city council, to take a moment of silence. So if you would, please join us in a moment of silence, too. Uh, Honor Joyce Connors. Thank you very much. All right, with that, Trish, we will move on to proclamations. We have three proclamations tonight. Proclamation number one is historic or Hispanic Heritage Month proclamation, September 15th to October 15th. Lincoln Lion Pride Week, September 25th to the 29th. And Crop Hunger Walk Day in Dubuque, October 7th. Thank you, Trish. So our first proclamation this evening is for National Hispanic Heritage Month, and I believe we have Yara Lopez here to accept this proclamation. Yara, would you like to say anything before the proclamation is delivered? Feel free to just come up and... Somebody has something to say. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, Ready? I think so, okay. yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who was here. Dubuque Unidos has worked really hard to put together this proclamation, and we just thank you all for taking the time to recognize the National Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank, thank you. you very much for being here to accept this proclamation. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to try something a little crazy tonight. I, uh, of course, the largest group that I've ever seen in here has to, has to be here for this, but I've already informed the group. I'm going to read the proclamation in English, and then I'm going to do my very best to read the proclamation in Spanish in honor of National Hispanic Heritage Month. So, yeah. I, w I wouldn't cheer until after you've heard me read it. <laughs> City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas Hispanic Heritage Month is an opportunity to celebrate the contributions of Hispanic Latino culture in our city, and whereas we recognize the diversity present within the Hispanic community, represented by numerous countries worldwide, and whereas we recognize that many members of the Hispanic community are the farm workers, meat packers, and construction workers that feed our communities and build our homes and businesses, and whereas we also recognize that many members of the Hispanic community are professionals who represent and serve as role models to our younger generations. And whereas the members of the Hispanic community are multilingual and represent different races, beliefs, and lifestyles. And whereas the city of Dubuque is committed to recognizing Hispanic Latino culture and heritage as an important part of our city. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, mayor of the city of Dubuque, Iowa, do hereby proclaim the 15th of September to the 15th of October, 2023 as National Hispanic Heritage Month. E. Ciudad de Dubuque, proclamación. Considerando el mes de la herencia España, es una oportunidad para celebrar las contribuciones de la cultura hispana, España Latino y nuestra, en nuestra ciudad. Y por cuanto reconocemos la diversidad presente dentro de la comunidad de España, la cual está representada por numerosos países y nivel mundial. Y por cuanto reconocemos que muchos miembros de la comunidad de España Son trabajadores agrícolas, pasadores de carne y trabajadores de construcción que alimentan a nuestras comunidades y construyen nuestras casas y negocios. Y por cuanto, también reconocemos que muchos miembros de la comunidad de España son profesionales que representan y sirven como modelos a seguir para generaciones futuras. Y por cuanto los miembros de la comunidad de España son políglotas y representan diferentes razas, creencias y estilos de vida. Y por cuanto la ciudad de Dubuque está comprometida a reconocer la cultura y el patrimonio español latino como parte importante de la ciudad. Por lo tanto, yo, Brad M. Cavanaugh, alcalde de la ciudad de Dubuque, Iowa, por la presente proclamo, El 15 de septiembre del 2023 al 15 de octubre del 2023 como Mes Nacional de la Herencia España. Even signed it in Spanish. <laughs> okay, and so I'll, I can just go ahead. Yeah. Right. Next one is Lincoln Lion Pride Week, and I believe uh, Candice Udaley Lobach is here, and some other members of the Lincoln Lions are here. Good evening, my name is Megan Elsinger, and I'm the principal at Lincoln Elementary, located at 555 Nevada Street here in Dubuque. I'm going to have the rest of our group introduce themselves, and then I will um, readdress the council. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Crystal Tatro. I live at 1150 Mount Pleasant Street, and I'm happy to have three children at Lincoln. Hi, I'm Liz Tyler. I live at 1030 Melrose Terrace, and I have one Lincoln Lion and one future Lincoln Lion. <laughs> I'm Candace Udaley Lobach, uh, 1715 Glen Oak Street, and I have two Lincoln Lions. Good evening. On behalf of the staff, students, families, and our neighbors at Lincoln Elementary, we'd like to thank the City Council, Mayor Cavanaugh, and City staff for your ongoing support of the Lincoln Outdoor Wellness Project. This project will allow for needed updates to our playground, which also turns into a city park after school hours. It will offer a safe, engaging space for families throughout our city to enjoy. Our goal is to continue to connect our families to school and community, and we believe that this project will help us do that. 
The City of Dubuque has been a supportive partner in this work, and we're grateful for the opportunity to update the space and welcome new and familiar faces to Lincoln Elementary. We would love to invite all of you to our Lincoln Carnival, which will take place next Thursday, the 28th from 3.30 to 6 at our Lincoln Playground. It will be the last carnival at our current site. Thank you for your ongoing support of Lincoln Elementary, our community, and for having us here this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for being here to accept this proclamation. And as you know, I'm a proud Lincoln Lion family, so very happy to see you here this week. Um, sad to hear this is the last carnival in that playground, but, but also excited for what the future holds. So thank you very much for being here to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the people associated with Lincoln School, PALS, is a nonprofit organization with the mission of supporting the education of children at Lincoln Elementary School by fostering positive relationships among the school's administration, staff, parents, and neighbors. And whereas Lincoln's mascot is the lion, and its mission is to ensure that every Lincoln student will be a lifelong learner with a den to call home. This mission is uniquely important because Lincoln Elementary School is a neighborhood-based public school serving grades pre-K through five, including two of the city's homeless shelters. And whereas one of the school's core values is that the Lincoln campus serves as a safe place where students, families, and neighbors feel heard, respected, and engaged. And whereas the week of September 25th through the 29th, 2023, is established as Lincoln Lion Pride Week. And whereas the neighborhood and broader community is invited to celebrate the week at the PALS annual neighborhood community building event, the Lincoln Carnival, on the Lincoln campus, 555 Nevada Street, on September 28th from 3.30 to 6. And whereas PALS is grateful for the partnership of the City of Dubuque on its outdoor wellness project and neighborhood relations efforts. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the week of September 25th through 29th, 2023, as Lincoln Lion Pride Week. Our final proclamation this evening is the Crop Hunger Walk Day in Dubuque, accepted by Sue Haddle and Lynn Rusk, I believe. Come on up. I'm Sue Haddle, 3070 Cane Court, Dubuque, Iowa. And I'm Lynn Rusk, 2995 Castle Woods Lane in Dubuque. And we're happy to be here to celebrate the uh, Crop Hunger Walk that will be held in Dubuque October 7th. The participants can walk, run, ride, or drive through Eagle Point Park to work toward alleviating hunger in our community. The walk will help uh, alleviate hunger globally as well as uh, contribute to our con uh, organization's Dubuque Rescue Mission, uh, Dubuque food pantry, and people in need organizations. And we are a, a subcommittee of the Dubuque Area Congregations United Interfaith Organization. Well, thank you so much, Sue and Lynn, for being here to accept this proclamation and for all your work on this great event for a very good cause. Oh, yes, please. Go and on. I forgot to mention that we are dedicating the walk this year in memory and honor of Robert Bob Crayer a community servant and longtime organizer of the Crop Hunger Walk, Hunger Walk and the impact that he's made in our community on so many people. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas, since 1946, Crop Church World Service has had walks to collect funds to alleviate hunger overseas and in the United States. And whereas, Crop Hunger Walk pledges now, the pledges now meet human need in over 70 countries with disaster and emergency response, refugee and immigrant services, and economic and social upheaval response. And whereas, Dubuque Rescue Mission, Dubuque Food Pantry, people in need, each will equally share 25% retained locally of the total amount collected. And whereas, Dubuque Annual Crop Hunger Walk will take place Saturday, October 7th, 2023, at Eagle Point Park, 
at 2601 Shiras Avenue in Dubuque. At 9 a.m., registration at the Eagles View Pavilion and 10 a.m., dedication, blessing, and walk. And whereas the 2023 Crop Hunger Walk is dedicated in honor of Robert Bob Crayer, a longtime Hunger Walk coordinator and community servant. And whereas the Crop Hunger Walk will raise funds to help stop hunger both locally and globally. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim Saturday, October 7th, 2023, as Crop Hunger Walk Day in Dubuque and urge the residents of Dubuque to participate with the Dubuque Area Congregations United to support this walk. All right, Trish, we can move on to consent items. On the consent agenda items, at this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to have one of the items removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input. Please remember to state your name and address clearly for the record. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item that you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. Consent items can be found on pages two through four. All right, thank you, Trish. So these are the items that we vote on as a block, so they all get voted on together. So um, as Trish mentioned, they're on pages two through four. Does anyone in chambers have any of the items from the consent agenda they would like to remove for separate discussion? Seeing no one here, anyone virtually? Okay, and anyone from the city clerk's office? All right, thank you very much. Then back to the table for any discussion? Ms. Wethel. Mr. Mayor, I would like to hold number seven, correspondence from Resilient Community Advisory Commission curbside food scrap pickup program for further discussion. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended, except for number seven. Second by Farber. And a motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. On to number seven, Ms. Wethel, please. Yes. So I'm, just for the record, um, we were given a letter um, by uh, the members of the Resilient Community Advisory Commission regarding concerns for curbside food scrap pickup program and the future of that program. And I was wondering if we could just from city staff get an update on what where we're at with that and, and maybe just a little discussion um, as an update. Yeah, well that could be in the... Apologize, city manager Mike Van Milligan. That would generally be in the hands of the Solid Waste Agency. Um, they have a three-member board of directors and we do staff the agency for, for them. They're their own separate uh, 28 governmental unit and they are working on it. And so they have high hopes that they'll make progress. And other than that, I'm not any more prepared than that to give you any kind of update. I, don't. I think that's all that I really wanted to know. I, I personally have participated in the food scrap program for a very long time. I'm um, very grateful for it. We were, I believe, the first city in um, the state to participate in that program. Very um, proud thing for us as a sustainable community. And so um, I want to make sure that we're doing our part to support what organizations we need to to keep that on track. Thank, Thank you, Mayor. I have a, a follow-up, Mike. Um, so the, the letter mentions that um, it's basically urging us as a council to do anything we can. Essentially what you're saying is we are doing that currently because we have members of the council that are on this board and it's the board's role right now to deal with this challenge. Council action may or may not come later depending on what the board decides for this. Right, so um, the solid waste agency is set up as what's called a 2080 agreement which is allowed by state law 
and they establish separate governmental units, um, and that is the Solid Waste Agency. It has a three-member board of directors, two members of the city council, and one member of the Dubuque County Board. They then contract with the city for staffing, and so they are working with a, a consultant and, uh, and the uh, DNR to rectify the issues that have been identified. And so um, I don't see any particular action to be done by the city council at this point. I don't know if any of the agency board members feel differently than that. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I, I've been on the board for a long, long time. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, a cease and desist letter did not occur from anybody at any time that's fabricated by one of the advocates uh, who seems to dislike everything that we do these days. Um, there is an issue. Um, the state DNR had misinterpreted their own rules for the last dozen years or so on how much uh, food waste could be incorporated with other organics and placed into compost. Um, they've, they've asked us to rectify that. Um, my belief is that they won't shut us down as long as we're taking steps advancing towards a solution. Now, it could be a very expensive solution, and this is all on the solid waste agency's dime, not the city's. Um, the city would probably be um, managing the project because it would occur at the city's landfill, that the agency's landfill that the city operates. Um, we are in conversation, staff is in conversation with the DNR. For the time being, they've allowed us uh, till the end of October to show them next steps. Um, since then, the agency has hired a, an engineering firm to do test borings at the area that the composting occurs. Um, it may be that if it's got enough of a clay foundation and doesn't leach fluids, that it'll be a non-issue and we can continue the operation as we've, as we've done it. Um, I think that's the unlikely scenario, although it is a pretty much of a clay bowl that it sits in. So that could be the scenario. Um, the, other, uh, the other public accusations are that staff didn't do this, staff didn't do that, staff, none of that is true. Staff's been working hard on this and other priorities as established by the agency for the, for the long haul. Um, this affects only 500 people, but for the last uh, dozen years, it's been flawless. There's been absolutely no deleterious effect from blending food scraps in with, with uh, other compostable material. Um, one of the challenges in the region, though, and most of you remember that uh, there was a private composting operation out near Farley, Iowa that was a disaster. They were gathering uh, industrial food waste from all over the region and, and throwing it in this pile of slop that stunk all the way to Dyersville, and the DNR finally shut them down. Um, we're, we're treading very carefully not to create that kind of situation. We want to make sure that the mix is right. I'll tell you that today, um, even though we're only um, able to use, have 500 participants, um, it enhances the soil product that comes out the other end of the process. It's available to anybody for free. Bring your own buckets, come down to the um, Municipal Services Center, and you can, there's a bunker that you can fill up your buckets and take it home and enhance your garden. It's very, very good compost. It's tested. It's not toxic. It's, it's great stuff. So um, we're working on this. Um, there may be a point where we have to decide if, if the cost is worth the benefit. And we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But to me, it sure looks like, and, and I don't want to speak for the board. It's a three-member board. It's difficult because a majority of the board is sitting here. Um, but since we're in an open public meeting, I, I feel like I can reach a little bit. Um, my sense is that the board supports keeping the program if it's at all possible. And we, we should have the capability to do that. So that's where we're at. That's helpful, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right. Ms. Wethel, you held that. Would you care to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Actually, Mayor? no, it's just the... Just could the I, go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Espinosa. If I could, uh, I'll move to receive and file number seven. Sure. Second by Farber. Okay, got a motion by uh, Mr. Resnick, second by Farber. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Cabinon? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Move on to items to be set for public hearing. We have one agenda item to be set for public hearing on October 2nd, 2023. It is the vacating of a portion of access and trail easement across lot one of Dubuque Industrial Center South, fourth edition. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolution, and set the public hearing for October 2nd. 
Second by Wethel. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Wethel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Moving on to boards and commissions, we have appointment to the Equity and Human Rights Commission to be made at this meeting. And council has one additional public input uh, that's placed at their seats that came in um, right at the last minute today. All right, thank you very much, Trish. Okay, so we have two uh, positions on the Equity and Human Rights Commission to fill. One is a three-year term through January 1st, 2024. The other is a three-year term through January 1st, 2025. We will go with the, um, what I'll ask is that we will go with the first term through 24 first. And I would ask that Trish, you call the roll and everyone can name a candidate that they would like to vote for for this position, please. Wethel. David Heyer. Kavanaugh. David Heyer. Roussel. David Heyer. Sprank. Uh, David Heyer. Jones. David Heyer. Farber. David Heyer. Resnick. David Heyer. So David Heyer is appointed to one three-year term through January 1st, 2024. So now we can go with the other term through January 1st, 2025. So Trish, would you call the roll again, please? Wethel. Rick Baumhover. Kavanaugh. Rick Baumhover. Roussel. Michaela Freiberger. Sprank. Rick Baumhover. Jones. Michaela Freiberger. Farber. Michaela Freiberger. Resnick. Michaela Freiberger. So Michaela Freiberger is appointed to the other term on January 1st through January 1st, 2025. So um, we are in a unique situation because so many of you have decided to join us. We're over capacity for this room. So what we need to do is, if you're not here to speak to the first public hearing, which is where we're gonna go next, and that public hearing, just to announce, and, and Trish is gonna do it officially, but it is the request to rezone property at 1749 Churchill Drive. If you're here for that, you may stick around. If you're not, I would ask that you please um, step out into the hall, and Alexis Steger is wearing a blue shirt right there. She's going to direct you to where you can go and watch this. If you are all here for that, I would still ask that those of you that are standing, if you could please, there is a monitor in the hallway right there. Um, you'll be able to see what you're, what you need to, um, and you'll, you'll be able to see what you need to uh, see out there. But um, if you want to speak to this, you can you can stick around. You'll still be able to hear everything you need to hear about this if you don't intend to speak. All of you are not going to get the opportunity to speak. I'll tell you that right up front. So I'll explain a little bit more in a few minutes. But um, if some, some folks could step out of the room, that would be very, very helpful, please. Thank you. And thank you very much, Krenna. Thank you very much for your cooperation, everyone. Safety first, as they say. All right. As we get transitioned here, Trish, we can go ahead and move on to public hearings, please. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for a public hearing you would like to speak to. Please st state your name and address clearly for the record. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question. Phone participant, participants, please state your name and address when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for a public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Tonight we have 13 public hearings, so Mayor Kavanaugh, if you don't mind, uh, because of such a large number of public hearings, I'd like to call each public hearing separately. So we'll start off with re 
Public hearing number one, request to rezone property at 1749 Churchill Drive. Mr. Mayor. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting of which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Se second. We got a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. Wally, please. It's a cross eyed barrier, I'm too tall. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Wally Wernemont, Planning Services Manager. Um, the request before you tonight um, is to uh, rezone property from R1 single family residential to R3C moderate density multifamily residential with conditions. I don't know if everyone can see that. Oh, Eric heard me in the background. That, so. um, the subject property consists of two lots with a combined area of 0.7 acres or 30,000 758 square feet. They're shown on this map included in your packet as the vicinity map. Um, there's actually two lots that are being requested for rezone. However, I'll, I'll speak to some conditions that the Zoning Advisory Commission placed on the, their recommendation, which actually eliminates one of these property, one of these lots from being rezoned. Um, the, um, the applicant's intent is to operate a maternity home with staff support for pregnant women. Um, a maternity home is classified as a group home, which is not a permitted or conditionally permitted use in an R1 zoning district, and that's currently what the property is zoned. Consequently, the applicant is requesting a conditionally rezone to R3 district in which a group home may be permitted through a conditional use permit, which would require review and approval from the zoning board of adjustment. So the request before you tonight is actually a conditional rezoning, and I'm gonna kind of step you through um, what are those conditions and what does that mean from a conditional rezoning. So first off, let's kind of talk about the process. Um, like we mentioned, it's requesting to be rezoned to R3 with conditions in order to allow for a group home on the subject property. The re review process includes re a rezoning request, requires a review and recommendation by the Zoning Advisory Commission, and then the City Council's the decision-making body on whether or not to grant this rezoning. Then, um, as part of this review, um, they're identifying a group home as a conditional use in R3C. And a conditional use permit is required to be reviewed and approved by the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Um, so if this goes through tonight and say, for instance, this was approved for rezoning, um, they would still have another additional step. They'd have to go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment in which there would be another public hearing. All property owners within 200 feet would be notified of the rezoning request. This is the exact same process that Mary's Inn has gone through previously when they were located at Balboa almost eight, nine years ago. Um, they went through a rezoning process in an R1 district. The rezone is a conditional rezoning to R3C. And I'm gonna kind of explain some of the, the uh, uses that are being struck um, from those different zoning um, permitted uses and conditional uses. And list what the conditions were that were placed on that property, which are similar or the same what they're looking at at this property. So as you look at this chart, which is included in your, in your packet, this identifies the um, principal permitted uses and, and we have a nice breakdown between the multiple districts here. So what you see on the left is our R1 single family zoning district. This is what the property is currently zoned. Um, the items highlighted in green are actually the permitted uses. These are all the permitted uses that are allowed in that zoning district. The middle column is R3 district. So if there were rezones to straight to a straight R3 zoning district, which is a multifamily residential district, all the items identified in green are exactly the same as what would be allowed in R1 single family residential districts. The items that are highlighted in red are actually uh, additional uses that would be allowed in that R3 zoning district. So when the Zoning Advisory Commission reviewed the request, um, they recommend a conditional rezoning which actually eliminates those three red uses. So that third column that you're looking at are gonna be all the principal permitted uses that would be allowed in the R3C zoning district. As you can see, they're identical to what's allowed in an R1 district. I'll get to the next chart, which is kind of why we're here. So um, those are the principal permitted uses. Now let's talk about the conditional uses. So just, just like I explained before with principal uses, the column to the left is an R1 zoning district. These are all the 
uses that are, are permitted by, are, are allowed as a conditional use. And a conditional use means that they may be permitted, just they have some additional review and requirements they have to go through the zoning board adjustment, additional criteria they need to meet. Um, there is a public hearing for these. Everyone gets notified within 200 feet for those uses. The middle, I, the middle column is our three zoning district. And once again, we highlighted all in green, all the same uses that are allowed in an R1 district. You will notice that keeping of horses or ponies are not permitted in an R3 district. Um, so they're not actually being included um, with this conditional rezoning. But we do highlight a property in uh, the use group home, a conditional use in yellow, and just to draw attention. Because um, in an R3 district, a group home is a conditional use. All the items located in red are conditional uses that are allowed in the R3 zoning district. Um, what the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending is they strike all those uses from the conditional uses. So what you see in that third column on the right would be the only conditional uses that would be allowed, which is all the same ones that are allowed in the R1 zoning district minus the keeping of horses or ponies with the addition of group home. Is that, does everyone kind of understand that? Okay. So this is a memorandum of agreement um, that the uh, property owner needs to sign prior to rezoning the property. Um, this was an agreement that was put together and there's an agreement that was signed for the Balboa property as well. Um, I'm just gonna kind of step through this a little bit. It may be hard to see, but um, as you look at the conditions, um, which is uh, uh, letter A, those, we list the, it's a list of permitted uses that shall be limited to all those properties that we just talked about located in the green, which are all exactly the same uses that would be allowed in an R1 single family Sony district. Um, number two is a list of all the conditional uses that would be allowed in this conditional rezoning. Everything's permitted with the exception of um, allowing a group home as a conditional use, which once, once again has to go through an additional public hearing process before the zoning board adjustment. As you read through this, uh, the additional other requirements of that, there is a clause that says reclassification of subject property. The city of Dubuque, Iowa may initiate re zoning reclassification proceedings to the R1 single family residential district if the property owner fails to complete any of the conditions or provisions of the agreement. So by signing this, they are agreeing to, if they're not following those conditions, the city of Dubuque may initiate rezoning of the property back to R1 single family residential. Um, public input. So this public input I'm providing to you was provided at the Zoning Advisory Commission meeting. I've seen, um, when I went on the online agenda, there's been several letters of support and some additional letters of opposition that were provided. So what I'm referencing um, will be just what I was what we received at the Zoning Advisory Commission, um, but I'll talk about um, how that impacts your voting tonight. So we received a petition, a petition that was signed by 38 neighboring residents. We received letters of opposition um, from Stephen and Suzanne Jurgens, and then Diana Robinson. And then at the Zoning Advisory Commission meeting, we had uh, six individuals speak in opposition and three speak in support. So public input wise, so including your packet is this this map that we created. So with regards to rezonings, we're required by our ordinance to notify all property owners within 200 feet of the subject property to be rezoned. That is the red boundary that you're seeing shown on this map. Um, so when we take the petition that was submitted to us, because we have written opposition, uh, we went through that petition and we identified all those property owners that were within that 200 foot donut and we shaded them red. So they have stated in, in writing that they're opposed to the rezoning request. In addition, we provide those two dots, which were those letters of um, opposition that we received to, from the two property owners. And then we also identified um, areas that are shaded in green, which are individuals that were in opposition to the rezoning as well, but they lie outside the 200 foot uh, notification donut. Um, and the reason uh, why I keep saying this 200 foot notification donut is because if 20% of the land inside that donut um, is owned by property owners who are, not, who are opposed to a rezoning request, that forces a super majority vote at the city council level. That means six of seven of you need to vote in favor in order to approve the rezoning request. That's stated in our unified development code um, for the city. Um, so I just kind of just went over that uh, with that. So we have over 20% of those property owners that are in opposition of the request before you. 
Um, there has been some discussion with regards to um, whether or not a maternity home is considered a group home. Um, we have always interpreted a maternity home as a group home, even back to uh, when they rezoned the property at Balboa um, for the property and the purposes before you. Um, we have additional information um, that I'll be able to provide to you if you have any additional questions with regards to the rezoning request. Um, and I'm sure I'll probably have some answers for some of the questions you might have as we move through the public hearing. So. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Wally. Before I, um, before I ask for any public input here, I, I do want to mention, I noticed I, I may have act inadvertently kicked the members of the media out of the room when I, when I tell them here. They're okay. Okay. Great. All right. As long as they're good. I didn't, I wanted to make sure they knew they're perfectly welcome to come into our public meeting. Um, okay. So, uh, we are in a public hearing to consider a request to rezone property at 1749 Churchill Drive from R1 single family residential to R3C moderate density multifamily residential with submitted conditions and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. So at this point, I will ask if there's any um, public input, but before you get up, let me, let me just uh, lay some, some ground rules since there are so many of us. Clearly, most of you are here for this because um, I asked other people to leave. So thank you very much for coming. Um, first of all, let me say that we very much appreciate the public input that we have received and um, appreciate the public input here this evening. Uh, when, you, when you come and, and speak up like this in a public meeting, you make our community strong and you make our democracy even stronger, so thank you for being here. With that said, um, a couple of, of ground rules that I want to follow. We have a really packed agenda tonight, and, and I apologize that that is the case, but it is the case, and this is not the only rezoning we have. We've got quite a bit. So normally we have limitations on public input, and I'm going to enforce them a little more tonight than usual because we might have so much public input. So a couple things. I'm going to limit the public input period to 30 minutes. And that means that I want to limit each of you individually to five minutes if you have anything to say. So if you could try to come in under that five minute mark, that'd be helpful. Then more people can get a chance to speak. Um, with that said, the request that I always make for anyone who comes up is that we try to keep it civil, please. Um, I, I understand that sometimes emotions can run high for things like this. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be emotional. Um, but what I do want you to refrain from is attacking anyone individually or attacking any one of us as a council or anybody for any reason um, verbally. So I would appreciate it if we could try to keep it civil. Even if you are upset, that's okay. Um, next up. If you would like to speak, you can queue up at the wall right over here, and, and we'll just kind of keep on going as we go here. And then um, as, as we go through this, um, you can, there's a little button on the podium. You might have seen people use it. It goes up and down. So if you are short in stature like me, you can go a little lower. If you're taller like Wally, you can go a little higher, and uh, staff can help you out if need be. So with that, if there is anyone who would like to speak uh, for public input, then please we can queue up right over here. Uh, one final thing as you come up is, no, you can go ahead and come on up. And one final thing as you do, um, you know, if somebody has already made the points you want to make, um, you can kind of just say ditto. You don't need to go rehash the whole, uh, the whole thing if you don't want to. We've received a lot of public input about this, and we appreciate that, so, so know that that is the case. All right. I already started the 30 minutes, so we're down to 22. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So, and oh, and um, always remember this to name and address, please, um, as, you, as you present your information. So, please. Uh, good evening. My name is John Freund. My address is 1005 Main Street, Suite 200. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, city staff, thank you for uh, listening uh, to this application. Um, I am an attorney representing Mary Zinn, who is uh, the applicant in this particular rezoning. I'm going to speak about the application itself and address many of the issues that Mary Zinn has heard from neighbors and the greater community, and a few legal issues that have also been raised. Uh, I do want to point out that Mary Zinn is represented also uh, by the chair of its board of directors, Bill Beaver. He's behind me. Uh, and also the executive director, uh, Colleen Pasnick, and she is here tonight. She has been the executive director since Mary Zinn was founded in 2015. Um, also, there are many other staff members, board members, other supporters of Mary Zinn who are here tonight. And uh, Mr. Mayor, like you said, uh, a lot of people might walk up and just say ditto. So maybe to circumvent that, I'd just like everyone in support of Mary Zinn to raise their hands so the council can see who you are tonight. Um, that, might, uh, that might obviate the need to uh, have everybody step up and, and say ditto. The first thing that I want to do is explain a little bit about Mary Zinn and what its operations are. Uh, this is a rezoning application. 
so, you know, the, the mission of Mary's Inn and, and the operations might not uh, be germane to every part of the rezoning, but I do think it's important for you to understand how the operations will impact both the property and the neighboring properties. Um, Mary's Inn is a nonprofit organization. It provides housing and guidance uh, to mothers as they prepare for birth and then begin raising their infants. Uh, the mothers come from varied walks of life, uh, but they're all in need of a strong support system. Mary's Inn has operated in a house on Balboa Drive for over eight years and has, has had to go through the exact same rezoning process in 2015. Uh, back then, in 2015, the City Council voted unanimously to rezone the property from Balbo at Balboa Drive from R1 to R3 conditional, and that's exactly what we're asking you to do again tonight. We understand that rezoning can be a very charged subject. The applicant, which would be us, is usually asking uh, the City Council or the Commission to consider a use that's outside of the historical norm for the neighborhood or the community. And as Mr. Wernemont pointed out, in this case, uh, the requested change is to permit the operation of a group home uh, at 1749 Churchill Drive. And that's the only significant change that we're looking at here. Uh, um, the need to apply for a group home only exists because we are seeking to house various unrelated women living under one roof. And under Iowa law, they do not constitute a family. Nevertheless, Mary Zinn wants the atmosphere uh, for these young women and their babies to be as family-like as possible, just like it is on Balboa Drive. That's why we're looking for an actual residence rather than commercial space. That's why we want a place with a yard and friendly neighbors. And that's why we think that Mary Zinn is a perfect fit for this neighborhood. And that's also why we've made uh, some of the concessions that you heard about before, which is Number one, there are two parcels on this property. We are willing to forego rezoning the northern parcel and just leave uh, the, the southern parcel as R3 conditional. Secondly, we are willing to commit to apply for rezoning back to R1 if Mary's Inn ever sells the property. We understand that there are concerns about what, what happens if we move out and, and will somebody else step in and try to do something uh, that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight. Uh, I'm here to tell you that we are committed to uh, doing everything we can to get it back to R1 if we are not going to be the owners of that property. And uh, finally, as Mr. Wernemont also pointed out, if for some reason Mary's Inn is not operating under the conditions that are agreed to, uh, the city can, volunteer, or can, can start an involuntary rezoning back to R1, and we, we perfectly agree with that. Our goal is to eliminate all the fears that the neighbors might have about how our presence will impact their community. We've met with them twice. We've provided written uh, responses to their concerns. And in your materials, you, you have a, a, a summary of all the points I've made, um, and, and also, I, I want you to consider a few other things. If this, if this property remains R1, that doesn't guarantee that a, a perfect neighbor will move in. Uh, someone who doesn't keep up the house or uh, throws loud, loud, loud parties or has a stream of guests in and out or who drives recklessly, all that can happen under R1. Uh, on the other hand, we are trying to be as transparent as possible with what this R3 uh, conditional designation will mean to the neighborhood. We will have a maximum of four women and their babies. Most of the time, there will be no more than two to three. Mr. Our Ford, operation- I'm sorry, I got you at 5.30, just so you know, oh, right now. All right, well, I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Maybe I'll truncate this. I did want to address a couple of legal issues. One was uh, the terminology between uh, group home and maternity home. As, as we've pointed out, Mary's Inn does not, uh, it, it, it doesn't fit in, or, I should back up. Maternity home is not a definition that's used in a legal sense with us. It's, it's really a term of familiarity. If group home is the term that we need to fit under, we're, we're perfectly fine with that label. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that the argument of maternity home versus group home uh, carries much weight. The other legal concept I wanted to address was spot zoning. Um, recently, well, in 2016, I should say, the Iowa Supreme Court addressed a, a 
spot zoning case that happened just down the road at the Field of Dreams. The application was to go from agricultural to commercial, and, and that was obviously to promote the Field of Dreams site. The Supreme Court of Iowa pointed or noted that that was indeed spot zoning, but it was not illegal spot zoning. Spot zoning is not in and of itself uh, against the law. The only, what, what you as a council need to do is ask the question, are, is, is, this a reason, is there a reasonable basis for this rezoning? And does it, does it fit into the comprehensive plan? And I would submit to you that, that number one, this is not spot zoning, but number two, even if it is, there is a reasonable basis. And also, it, it fits right into uh, the, the comprehensive plan. And I've, I've checked the box on several of the items here yeah. that, that are on the Imagine Dubuque 2037 call to action. With, with that, I will ask you to wrap up, but thank you. All thank right. you very much. Thank you very comments. much. Mayor and members of City Council, my name is Colleen Pasnick. I live at 1535 Alta Vista Street. I'm the director of Mary's and Maternity Home and has been since we opened eight years ago. The reason that we are interested in the particular property on Churchill is because not only does it give us more living space for the residents, but the attached space um, on the back of the garage uh, gives us a place for our, us to have a couple offices. So right now my office is off site and we function better when my office is on site um, so that's the reason for this particular property. We have looked at about a dozen other properties, but none of them offered both those things, enough room for the residents and a space for um, my office and a supervisor's office. So one of the concerns that the neighbors have mentioned was increased traffic. So if you saw on the map, um, our, the Churchill residence is only about a half a block after you turn onto Churchill from Pennsylvania, so the vast majority of residents of Churchill and Eden Drive will not be affected by any cars coming and going to Mary's Inn. Um, most of our residents have not had cars, and so the um, most common situation is that a staff member would take a resident um, to an appointment, but sometimes we do have volunteer drivers that would come um, and take them. But we also want to foster independence and self-sufficiency in our residents, so they will be encouraged to take the bus and our current maternity home is 10 blocks from the closest bus stop, and the, matern or the house at Churchill is two blocks from um, a bus stop. Another concern of the neighbors is parking, and I do want to mention that there is enough garage parking that the people that are working can park in the garage, so they wouldn't be parking on the street. And then there's space in the driveway for another couple cars if someone does come. So um, we do not foresee any uh, on-street parking. Um, I also want to mention that we always have one staff member working. So the house is staffed 24 seven. So there's always one person there at the house. And then if I'm there, then I would be there Monday through Friday as well. So that's um, just more on-site management. Um, and there's no group home in the city that has a problem with behavior if there's on-site management. Um, our program is a voluntary program for women who want to make um, a better life for themselves and their babies. Um, and so that's, that's why they're there. Um, we are the only maternity home in Eastern Iowa. Larger cities like Cedar Rapids and Waterloo and the Quad Cities do not have a maternity home. And I think that's because the people of Dubuque support moms and babies. And that support includes giving them a safe place to live. Our current property on Balboa blends in so well with that neighborhood that oftentimes when visitors come to Mary, Mary's Inn, they're not even sure they have the right place because we look just like any other home on the street. Um, so I would just like to wrap up my comments by saying um, last month, the city of Dubuque said that its goals were, quote, building a community that is viable, livable, and equitable. Um, a maternity home in a quiet, safe neighborhood exemplifies this. The Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending that you approve the rezoning request. So please vote yes to rezoning, rezoning the property at Churchill. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen, for your comments.
William R. Beaver, 1320 Oath Court, Dubuque. I'm the applicant who filed the application. Uh, on behalf of Mary Zinn Board of Directors, I'm currently the president of the board. You've already been provided in your packets with a lot of written input uh, prior to this evening, and you're going to hear much more input as in favor and in opposition to this. And so, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, divert from my written narrative, with, which is more lengthy, and try to paraphrase this as best as I can for the sake of the other people who would like to speak. So I'd just like to begin by, uh, by stating that um, you may hear that it's illegal that we were given the R3C designation over on Balboa and that we shouldn't be repeating an illegality here on 1749 Churchill. Well, I would submit that that particular issue is more appropriately resolved in a courtroom rather than in a public hearing, and that you should pay closer attention to what our city zoning ordinance has to say than what one of the lawyers who represents the opposition to the application might have to say. You may have read and you will hear that there have been no complaints filed against Mary's Inn in the eight years of its operation at 2750 Balboa. Mm -hmm. I hope this initially inclines your mind to a vote of yes. You've read or you may hear that Mary's Inn has conceded. In fact, Mr. Freund already stated that we're willing to leave the vacant lot, the northern parcel, remain R1, so you do not have to address that, which was a big concern of the neighbors. And we're also willing, at our expense, to, re to apply to rezone the property back to R1 in the event that we should sell the property. I think this, too, you'll agree with this concession, is more than a show of concern for what seems to be one of the neighbor's greatest fears. You've read or will hear that occupancy will be as follows. Four residents maximum, two to three moms and babies typical. One member of the staff in the house during the day, one member of the staff at night. One staff person in the carriage house, the appended structure that is kind of behind the, the main part of the dwelling. And intermittently, there could be other three staff members for an hour or two there to consult with Colleen Pasnick, our director. Um, Sheena Moon, the associate zoning planner, has attested at the September 6th meeting of the Zoning Advisory Commission that the city finds that such occupancy should not negatively impact traffic or present any problems with parking in the neighborhood. You may hear from the neighbors that they don't think that we can be responsible for the maintenance and the upkeep of such an older home, and that since I personally work for the church, I may not have sufficient expertise to direct or coordinate repair and preventive maintenance of the exterior and interior systems of such a large structure. Please be advised that all, although I do serve the church and have for 37 years, I have also worked for 40 years licensed as by the state of Iowa in the engineering profession. My education includes an MS degree in engineering. My background includes roles in design engineering, engineering management, and plant enge engineering supervision at Mercy Medical Center. Furthermore, I'm already building a team of volunteers, some of whom have a depth of experience in maintaining group homes and the facilities within the Dubuque school system. Another reason to incline you to vote yes. You may have read or will hear speculation about the presence of lead paint, asbestos, termites, and the observation of groundhogs and other critters in and around the house. An inspection has already ruled some of these things out, but be assured that we will deal with what needs to be dealt with. In my communication with Mr. Jeff Zasada of City Housing, I've learned that our oversight is governed by the International Residential Code when it comes to egress and other housing code requirements. We will continue to work with Jeff in terms of any future need to comply with those regulations. You may have read or will hear the fear expressed that the neighbor's property values will de decrease. 
Please be advised that Mary's Inn at 2750 Balboa was purchased in 2015 at a price of $195,000, and there's every reason to believe that the property may be sold tomorrow at a price in excess of $300,000. I think a pretty good indication that it is a myth that our property value that their property values will go down as a result of our presence. Lastly, just time check, five, five minutes right now, just so you know. Okay. I know you're wrapping up. Last sentence. You may hear from the neighbors in opposition that although they're fully supportive of Mary's Inn, that they're fearful, they're concerned, they're uncomfortable, or they're worried that our presence in the neighborhood is just not a good thing. And I think you'll agree that your decision probably should not be based on the feelings, which are temporary emotions, but it should be based on the facts at hand and the issues that I have addressed before you tonight. So in my mind, and I hope in your mind, it only makes sense that you say yes to these so that we can continue to grow as a diverse community <coughs> and we can together realize the comprehensive plan that the city of Dubuque puts forward. Thank you. Thank you, William, for your comments. I think it's the right height. Hi, my name's Coral Ayers, and I live at 2354 and a half White Street, Dubuque, Iowa. Um, <clears throat> my former address was 2750 Balboa. Um, I moved there three years ago when I was pregnant with my three-year-old. Um, I now have an eight-month-old as well, but I know we are talking about rezoning, but I know that um, some of you are not sure how Mary's Inn operates. I know it's not about how they operate, but what I want to make clear is that Mary's Inn is um, staffed by very strong women, women that don't put up with any bad behaviors, any bad attitudes, um, boys, men, no men allowed in the house. There's so many things that these women put into place so that we can become better women. I came from the streets with no family, nobody to help me and no support. I came from a different, a different state. And this is where I came and this is where I grew. I, um, landed a job at Four Mounds as their guest services coordinator, and now I'm doing an internship at Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services. So my life from there to now has improved so much, and I think that has to do with what they stand for, who they are, their values, and that can carry over to the yard work, the garden, the everything that they had us do. There's chores, there's structure, and there is no room, there is room for mistakes, but there is no room for bad behaviors, drugs, alcohol, anything of that sort. And I'm shaking, so I'm gonna say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Coral, for your comments. Um, hi, Mr. Mayor and the men and women of this council. Um, my name is Alicia Rasmussen. I live at 911 West Locust here in Dubuque. Um, I also am like Coral, I was at Mary's Inn and I didn't, I don't have any family here. I came from Des Moines and um, I came with nothing and Mary's Inn was there with open arms for me and my son. Um, I grew there, I, they helped me get a job. Um, yeah, like Coral said, there's, there's, they're just there for you, you know what I mean? And. Um, I couldn't thank them enough. I, they helped me start college, like they helped me decide to be that woman that I can be to start college and now I'm going for nursing, which is crazy, and um, just gave me um, faith within myself. They helped me find my faith again, you know, that I lost, and um, they truly became my family. You know, like at night, we eat dinner as a family. Um, you know, it says we can't be zoned as a family or whatever, but they truly became my family, all of them, each one of them. I love them all. Um, you know, the bonfires that we had and um, just the talks and just how deep we got with everything. And I will forever 
have them in my life for me and my son. It's the best thing that ever happened to me here in Dubuque. And um, yeah, I'm nervous too, so that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for your comments. Mayor and Councilmen and Women, I'm Christy Weisler. My address is 515 or 505. I'm nervous too because we're the hard um, staff. We, we don't bite, Chestnut I promise. Dry, we don't bite. Trail. <laughs> My name is Mary Kay Mueller and I live on 39815 Placid Lane in Bellevue, Iowa, and I'm house supervisor. And we're here today to speak on behalf of all of the Mary Zinn staff. Our goal at Mary Zinn is to empower our women to be the best moms they can be. We walk beside them as they learn life skills such as being good neighbors and what that means to be a good neighbor. Being a responsible member of society and giving back to the community that has given them so much. Living in this neighborhood on Church Hill would not only allow them to see healthy families, but it would inspire them even more to want that for themselves. So we are asking the council to vote from a place of compassion that we all are called to have for women and children. Just like Mary and Joseph struggled to find a place to birth Jesus, our ladies are just searching for a safe place to have their babies and raise them and become the best mom they can be. So thank you for voting yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy and Mary, Mary Kay. Thank you. Hello, uh, Lance Andre from 1735 Eden Lane, one of the houses in red on the zone uh, map there. Um, so first of all, I'd like to start off with just a qu couple quick items. I know in the zoning commission meeting, um, they had a couple terms they used. I'd like to correct those here for record. They referred to it as a vacant lot um, that's attached to the house. It's not. It's actually the green space in our neighborhood that was designed that way. Uh, it hosts swings, uh, tree house, and our neighborhood buddy bench, which was the prior owner's daughter that actually brought the buddy bench program uh, to Dubuque, Iowa there. Also, that lot has actually hosted a lot of community uh, from our neighborhood, neighborhood parties and get-togethers as well. Uh, also, you, they use the term carriage house. There is no carriage house on the property. It's an attached garage, as was mentioned uh, correctly here in the meeting uh, there as well. This carriage house has no kitchen, no bathroom, so that means the staff will actually have to use the kitchen or bathroom in the main house, which they used as the reason for selling the Balboa, uh, the Balboa house is it didn't have room for an office because when they used the office or a room there, they felt awkward always being with, with the staff there. Uh, obviously, they can fix that with costly construction. Um, obviously, we're talking about two zoning changes here. I know it was mentioned, you know, R3 with conditional, but it's offices and it's a group home that's being converted there. Um, one of the things that you'll see that is unique, I put up uh, an aerial photograph of the neighborhood there. All of the homes that you actually see in red, our neighborhood is very unique. They all face the old Letcher Mansion, as we call it. It's actually not as big as it sounds if you look at the square footage. But uh, Dick Letcher, who was the developer of that area, built all the homes with the porches facing his house, and that actually was the design of his neighborhood. Um, he was a very detail-oriented person, and he actually built a very nice neighborhood that we all live in. It's a very strong community. Um, I actually have, you know, know all the neighbors. I recognize them here because that's how our neighborhood is. They all face that area. Also, you'll notice that the lots in this neighborhood are not very big. Uh, this is a neighborhood that really relies on that central area, that central pivotal house there. Um, I've heard a number of cases where they said this is the perfect location for Mary's Inn. Um, I added a printout from Zillow, which probably isn't the complete listing, but there are, I believe, 16 homes that are less expensive and actually offer, um, offer Mary's Inn an opportunity to serve more women uh, in need. Everyone in our neighborhood, we all voice our support of Mary's Inn. It's just that spending a half million dollars for two to three women in this neighborhood, where unfortunately they're on display. Our neighborhood all faces that particular house, all right? Uh, we do have a, a ARC uh, community home actually already in our neighborhood, and they have supposedly a fewer number of staff at their home, and there were 
always multiple cars parked in the street, um, blocking actually Churchill getting out on there. I'm not saying anything against the ARC home, I just know that a group home creates a lot of traffic for the temporary volunteers that shuttle people back and forth. Our neighborhood, the only thing it's close to is maybe a bus stop. Um, it is not close to all the normal, already zoned R3 houses that offer those nor normal amenities in the, in the mixed um, living environment there. So, uh, real quick, this is an 1870s house. This house was built only 30 years after Iowa became a state. It is very historic, and a lot of the changes that we're talking about would actually change the historic value. Um, a fire escape from the second story. Um, having pregnant women climb an 1870s staircase, I also consider to be uh, an odd uh, choice for the perfect home as well. So again, no one here in our neighborhood is objecting to this. We're objecting to spending a lot of the money that our community has donated to this organization flipping houses. Um, also, our neighborhood, we would not gain anything by having people in and out of the neighborhood continuously every six to nine months, not adding to the value that we've grown up to in that community. So this isn't the perfect location. I hate to use this term, but I think the realtor was doing a lousy job proposing this house as being the ideal location for, for Mary's home. All right. Um, I had a number of other points here, but I'll keep it very short. Um, I'd like to say everyone, thank you, and I hope that uh, you vote against this and not vote against Mary's home, but hope they choose a location like a house that has 10 bedrooms, three bathrooms that could support more women in the community than the one that our entire neighborhood uh, is built around. A lot of our neighborhood is very um, vocal on this issue because of how strong our neighborhood is and how much that we are going to uh, uh, miss that. Yes, property values won't go down because they always go up. Uh, any property you pretty much buy is going to go up. That is not our concern. It's basically the concern of our neighborhood and what it means to no longer have a neighbor, just to have people in and out of that neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Lance, for your comments. I'm going to do a quick time check here. I think we have probably time for maybe three more comments. Uh, I know we've got a lot of people there, but I'll, we'll, we'll see where we go, depending on time. Mr. Mayor, could you limit the time less than five minutes and spread it out a little bit? I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job, Art. <laughs> Thank you, though. But yes, we will, we'll try. We'll try. Yeah. So let me just, let me just jump in real quick. Um, I, I appreciate that there are, there are two arguments here. There is opposition, and there are people that are for this. Um, we have received written comments in the format of both. Um, so what I would say is we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna stick to the time limit that I have that I've created. So we will try and go for. I, I looked at the clock when we started. It was gonna be about 7:45 when we were gonna be done. So we're we're pushing that right now. So we'll go for a few more people, and then I am gonna politely and respectfully cut us off so we can have this conversation as a council and and make our decision. So. With that, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and go. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Krista Clausen, and I reside at 154441 Stacy Court. I'm here representing my family at 2979 Pennsylvania, as well as my future interest. I would like to address two issues related to the Pros Mary's Inn Group Home Relocation to 1749 Churchill Drive. One, Mayor Kavanaugh, safety first. Two, oversight. Mary's Inn indicates both the dwelling and the building out for the offices in the carriage house will be in compliance with all city, state, or national ordinances governing the operation of group homes. Mary's Inn is a non-licensed group home with transient residents, both child and adult. According to an article by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, there are homes providing room, board, personal care that fall outside the bounds of state licensure requirements or are deliberately avoiding state licensure requirements. Some states um, permit unlicensed care homes to operate legally under the guidance of state regulations, others do not. In either case, while states regulate and provide some level of monitoring and oversight of licensed care homes, state and local oversight of unlicensed care homes can be minimal or non-existent. Um, another concern was uh, that even though these unlicensed homes were clean and free of neglect and abuse, commonly safety hazards do not meet fire safety codes required of licensed facilities. A call placed to Dubuque Housing Commission and Building Services revealed that unlicensed group homes with transient residents would not be inspected. 
the, there is not a current pathway for inspection of these homes, these homes would not even be on the radar. These unlicensed homes fall under very generic safety and inspection requirements. Licensed group homes undergo very stringent inspection and licensing requirements. We are informed that it is very costly and time consuming to have a house become a licensed group home by ARC. Mary's Inn plans occupancy in October, leaving no time for inspection nor compliance. Licensing, licensing includes staffing education certification. Mary's Inn staff are not even CBR certified. Licensed group homes undergo significant inspection by state architect whose checks for multiple items including lead and asbestos. They're also inspected by the state and city fire marshal and must comply with licensed group home regulations. In regard to fire safety, an unlicensed home will have fire detectors and measure window sizes and measure window sizes for second floor egress by pregnant women with infants or small children. Licensed groups home may need sprinkler systems as well an ex as an exterior stair structure for egress. I spoke with Dubuque Fire Marshal and he said a house of this age would have balloon construction. A fire may be harder to start, but once the fire reaches the walls, the fire would spread rapidly to the roof. There are no fire breaks or stops in this type of construction. All the resident bedrooms are on the second floor. Only egress a window. Iowa State Group Home Law 661.2025, Section 13 prohibits housing for non-ambulatory individuals above the ground level and, and may not, they may not require stairs or elevators for exit. Many states have licensed maternity homes and they have the same requirement. All the bedrooms are located on the second floor. Non-licensed groups homes have no required inspection for lead, asbestos, and other environmental hazards. Nine out of 10 homes built before 1940 have lead-based paint. Pregnant women, babies, and infants are most vulnerable to lead exposure. Exposure to lead during pregnancy has, shown, has known adverse effects on maternal health and infant outcomes. Elevated levels in pregnancy have been associated with gestational hypertension, spontaneous abortion, or miscarriage, low birth weight, and impaired neurodevelopment. Lead exposure prenatally and postnatally has been associated with developmental and behavioral problems with children. Protecting pregnant women and children from lead exposure is very important to assure health development. The CDC recommends removing lead hazards from the environment as a primary prevention. No blood levels are safe, so avoiding all exposure is advised. Mary's Inn provides a service for a very vulnerable population. We propose that approval for this relocation require compliance with licensed group home laws and regulations. Thank you, Christine. Um, all the articles. CDC articles and everything are in a folder. Thank you for your comments. Hi, um, Melissa Claussen, 2979 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, sorry, my name is Dr. Melissa Claussen, 2979 Pennsylvania Avenue. I grew up in this neighborhood, moved to California for medical school and work. I retired and moved back to my child home, to childhood home in 2021 to live and take full-time care of my mother with dementia. The goal being to keep her in a current home and neighborhood she loves. I fully support the mission of Mary's Inn. They are a wonderful nonprofit business providing a much needed service for our community. In 2015, they voted unanimous, unanimously because a service was needed within this community. And I believe they are, they are meeting that service currently. Mine and multiple neighbors' concerns are not Mary's Inn and their mission. The main concern is rezoning of the property on 1749 Churchill Drive from an R1 single family residential zone to an R3C moderate density family residential. I understand there will be a condition placed that it will function as an R1 single family resident. However, as was stated at the rezoning commission, it would be extremely difficult to rezone back to an R1 when Mary's Inn is no longer occupying the property. As a matter of fact, the reason the rezoning passed three to two was stated to be the comprehensive plan uh, and the need for diversity of neighborhood. The comprehensive plan encourages mixed use development to create a diverse and self-sufficient neighborhood. It also takes into consideration that incompatible houses or uses should be protected and buffered from, other, from each other. The stated goal of the Zoning Commission is to create neighborhoods with a diversity of zoning. So even if this property was attempted to be rezoned to an R1, it would most likely not pass. The rezoning to R3 conditional opens a pathway to develop the property to moderate density families such as townhomes, apartments, etc. With the adjacent vacant lot and current property location, it would be a nice parcel of land to develop. I would like to argue that this neighborhood already has a diversity of zoning and is self-sufficient. If you look at the aerial that we uh, sent through already, you'll find that the neighborhood already has a licensed group home, an ARC group home, one house away from 1749 Churchill Drive. 
We have the Applewood Senior Apartments two blocks to the west, and we have the Pennsylvania Manor Apartments two blocks to the east. To the west, we have JFK with grocery stores, businesses, restaurants. Everything is within walking distance. All this is with a feeling of community and a sense of place. The very reason I'm here to help mom continue to live in her home and neighborhood. She has a beautiful property, peaceful and surrounded by green space yet in the heart of the city. Her refrigerator is filled with artwork from the neighbor children who visit often and brighten her day. Multiple neighbors stop and socialize with mom and truly care about her well-being. I can attest I have not found this atmosphere to be present in the diverse neighborhoods of California. Neighborhoods like ours is what makes Dubuque such a desirable place to live and thrive. The spot zoning of this property uh, to an R3 is incompatible with the neighborhood. It is the center of the neighborhood that's been stated many times, and as you can see in that picture. Um, as a matter of fact, it was the first home built here, and the neighborhood was built around it. So it truly is the center of our neighborhood. Um, we have heard multiple concerns regarding this location, including safety of the home, safety of the uh, oversight of the home, of, of the safety, rezoning from R1 to R3, concern, concerns regarding what happens to the zoning when the home is sold, incompatibility with the neighbor, neighborhood, increase in density, increase in traffic, the use and zoning of the adjacent empty lot. It seems that if there are so many concerns and conditions that need to be attached to this property is an, is an indication that it's probably not an appropriate choice. Mary Zinn has start, stated on multiple occasions the reason they are moving to the property, or interested in moving to the property on 1749 Churchill Drive is the carriage home. The reasons that they've given us for moving are one, there's a bus stop. There's a bus stop currently uh, at their, near their current location, which is only 0 0.01 uh, miles uh, further than the bus stop on Pennsylvania. Um, they say they have outgrown their current home, yet the Balboa home is a four bedroom with a non conforming fifth bedroom and three bath, and the Churchill home is a four bedroom, three bath. And they state they have no intention of having more than four girls at a time. So they haven't grown in clients served as they, as they only allow children, they haven't grown in cl clients served, and as they only allow children under the age of two, they haven't grown in the requirements of growing children. Both Deacon Bill and Colleen. Uh, have said the main reason for moving is a carriage house and the interest in putting offices in the carriage house. It seems the primary reason for location is for the convenience and growth of the staff and less consideration of the babies and pregnant ladies being served. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your comments. All right, we are at 751. Um, I want to go till 755, and then I'm going to stop us. So, okay. My going. name is Chris Motto Omahan at 1765 Eden Lane. I'm going to request Mayor Kavanaugh that I give my time to Mr. Riley and his attorney, since we are out of time, that I think he could present this at this time better than I can. Am I able to do that? Well, I think, to be fair, we, we lined up. And, and we, okay. we, we knew the okay. rules to start with, so I, I'd prefer okay. you do that. We have heard from okay. attorneys in, in writing and also in, I understand. in voice, so thank you. Um, the one thing that I will say is a little bit disturbing is to have so many people, and I have to, have to tell you, I am a born-again Christian, and my faith is everything, and I stand for what they do. So we are not opposed to what they are trying to do to help women. But we are saying in this community, this is not right for this area. The majority of this neighborhood is asking you to please vote this down. And I'm asking you to, you yourselves, if you were sitting out here fighting for your neighborhood, and it was your neighborhood, either on Plymouth Court or any of the, the better, nicer areas in, in Dubuque, which it probably would not happen there, would you vote yes to put this next door to your home? Would you put this across the street from your home? It's not that we're not supporting them. It's just this will change the dynamics of a neighborhood where little kids ride their bikes flying down the street. This is a, this is a neighborhood where little kids literally leave their toys everywhere. Everybody knows everybody. It's not just people coming and going. This is, these are families rich in history there. And so we are asking you, please vote how you would vote for your own home. If this was your home and going next to you, next door, or across the street, how would you vote? That's what we're asking you to do. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your comment. No, no, no applause, please. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more. So we'll have one more, and then we're going to have a discussion here at the council desk. Hello, my name is Tracy Andre. I'm at 1735 Eden Lane. I would like to make it clear, too, that we are all in favor of the Marianne. In fact, 
we are all pretty much religious in our neighborhood, and we all have um, things that we support, and we support these types of things. We'd like babies. <laughs> So, um, however, we believe that the proposed move from Balboa to Churchill does not prior prioritize the well-being of these young ladies. Um, the Balboa has the space for them. It has more modern, um, current re regulated um, house, and the size of the rooms are bigger and better suits their requirements. And the Churchill house has smaller bedrooms, no egress windows, and has older home concerns. Um, just like was stated earlier, there's probably lead because that's when the house was built. And my husband helped out the previous owner on many occasions with this flooded basement. So I'm sure there's mold in there too. So mold and lead are really toxic for um, growing babies. So um, not only are the neighbors um, in support of this mission, we are, we are concerned too, you know. So, um, and also, like they said before, that Center Island is the showcase. So for their emotional well-being, I don't want them to think they're on display in the middle. You know, they're, you know the young, young women are a little bit like, oh, anyway, a little shy. So, so they would be right in the middle of everybody. Um, so anyway, I recommend that you reject um, the Marion coming into this location. And I think that's all I had to say. Probably just a reiteration of everything that was said, but I, I support not having them in there too. So, thank you, thank Tracy, you. for your comments. All right, I know, it's, I know it's not what everybody wants, but we are gonna stop public input at this time. So thank you very much for all the comments you've had. I, I, I assure you, we have read a lot this weekend. Um, so we'll have some discussions here. I no more time for any more public input. You, you may state your objection. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you for allowing me to object. There's at least 15 other people here that would like to speak for and against. I would encourage everyone the opportunity who took the time to come down and pay attention to this to actually, you get to hear them. I think it's important that you hear them. I think just ditto or or uh, you know, I, a raise of hands, that doesn't really give you the perspective that I think you need. I think the alternative to an arbitrary cutoff of the time, over which you have a great deal of discretion, I acknowledge that, would be to continue this hearing to another time when everybody could come and make an objective statement about what they have to say about this important issue. Thank you. All right. Thank you for stating your objection. I, now, I I'm going to disagree with you and respectfully do so. And the reason being, we, um, we have received an, an enormous amount of input on this. Absolutely enormous. More than I've ever received sitting on this council. More than I've ever received. This is an enormous amount of input that we have received from you all. I know these members of this council, we have read it. We spent the weekend reading it. We spent the weekend, weekend thinking about it. And we need to now have the time to discuss it and do it with you here in the room. So we appreciate your input that you've given us until now. We appreciate the input that you've given us in, in, in speaking tonight. Um, respectfully, I'm going to stop public input at this time. We're going to move on um, so that we can have a discussion as the council and, and uh, make this decision. So with that said, um, do we have, I, I do always need to ask, do we have any virtual input? Because we do have that um, as a, a second step in this process. Not. All right, thank you. Have we received everything from the city clerk's office that we Everything's received? Everything's been, been distributed, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Then I will bring it back to the table for council discussion, please. <laughs> Mr. Resnick. Yes, well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for their input. And I would like to thank all of those people for all their hard work, everyone involved, to get to where we are in this situation, where we have this R3C uh, practically functioning as an R1. And great. Uh, great discussions, and uh, I think there's a lot of caring for the neighborhood on, uh, from everyone. And I'm, a gentleman said that, um, that this is a strong neighborhood, and it made me happy to, to hope that Mary Zinn was moving to a strong neighborhood. And I think that uh, from, the, from the, what I've read and what I've heard, 
they're going to be an excellent, they would be an excellent member of this uh, neighborhood. Um, so to me, uh, St. Mary's is, uh, pardon me, uh, Mary's Inn, this is essential for women's health care, children's health care, family health care in a residential neighborhood. Uh, and they stress being good neighbors. And they've got good neighbors there. And so I think it's going to be, uh, uh, I really support, uh, again, the situation that everyone has worked long and hard for. I think they're going to take care of that property, bring it up to uh, as healthy standards as you possibly can. I think uh, we all agree, mother's health, baby's health, very precious. I know, um, you know, I think you just keep it simple like that. I, uh, again, I read a lot of things and I got a lot of positive information from a lot of people. So I think this solution is the right one and I plan to support it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Ms. Farmer. Yeah, sure. Um, again, first and foremost, I just want to thank everybody for appearing here tonight. I want to give a shout out to um, all the residents that sent us emails and their thoughts and comments because that really helps us better understand uh, the sentiment of the community surrounding this very significant issue. So uh, just a big thank you once again because that's what is so important for us is to hear your comments and your concerns. Um, second, regarding the zoning application and the um, issues on mold, lead, and other abatement issues, um, I very much respect the recommendation of the Zoning Advisory Commission, um, which does give us the restrictions um, with the conditions that were discussed. And I do appreciate the fact that the second uh, parcel will indeed be left as R1 and can be continued to be that playground and that open space uh, for everyone to enjoy. Um, I do um, have confidence that the staff of Mary's Inn knows what's best for its residents and its staff and will be able to accommodate um, spaces for um, living and for working. And I know that they will uh, basically adhere to all of the rules and regulations uh, for upgrades, for lead abatement, for any mold issues or any of the restoration issues. And that being said, I want to give a shout out to Carol Letcher, who is of the family uh, of the Letchers um, who built the home and who's also lived there. And I did have the privilege of spending some time with Carol and her family in that home. Uh, and I want to just really uh, shout out to the Letcher family. It is a historic gem. And I think whoever has the opportunity to live there next uh, and have experience there with Mary's Inn will not only have an appreciation for what Mary's Inn does, but also for the historic benefits that Dubuque has uh, in all of our, our properties. And it is a great neighborhood. So Carol, thank you for coming tonight. Greatly appreciate that. And regarding the neighborhood property um, and in terms of the, the values decreasing over time, uh, my experience really counters uh, this concern because I grew up off of South Grandview in a neighborhood that was hosted and still hosts an ARC home and the properties um, surrounding this uh, neighborhood home uh, have always increased in value and the ARC members have always been welcomed to this neighborhood. So I grew up with one of these homes in my neighborhood and they were just fun to be with as well as all of my other neighbors. Um, and also, I just want to mention that we as a community here in Dubuque really do aspire to be an all-inclusive community. And based upon the feedback that we receive from staff, volunteers, and all the women served by Mary's Inn, uh, indeed it does Im really, I think, uh, depict the image of inclusivity. And I believe that the mission and programs uh, are a great service, and there are other nonprofits that also help with um, the service provided to these women. And a shout out to Clarity Clinic, Opening Doors, uh, Teresa Shelter, and others. Um, and so I think this is really a unique opportunity. Um, and I really am appreciative of the fact that some of the folks in the opposition don't have any disagreement or any debate about the admirable operation that Mary's Inn is providing. Um, and I want to say that the testimonials of the young ladies that came in front of us tonight kind of speak for themselves. Um, but I did want to just mention a few email comments that kind of summarize everything in terms of what this mission is and what um, the neighborhood would look like with these members. 
Um, I see Dubuque as a town that is able and willing to help the most vulnerable in our community. Having such a well-run program here in Dubuque is one we should all support. There has never been a complaint filed against Mary's Inn. It promotes order and good conduct. Truth be told, I was so impressed with the structure and the accountability that it prompted me to brush up on my own parenting. All the staff are educated and wonderful. There are so many guidelines. I regret not having more of these guidelines in my own home when my children were growing up. So again, thank you to everybody for uh, coming and sharing uh, your, your thoughts and your concerns, and I will um, support uh, the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mm -hmm. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. This is another um, one of those really challenging issues that comes to our table. And I think what's really important, and I think what we do really well here, is that we listen to all of the residents that send us emails. As the mayor said, I have never received so much input on a topic as this one. And I think what's also important is to make sure that if we listen, if we hear of a concern, that we are going to ask the proper questions and address those concerns. Um, I liked, uh, as um, Councilmember Farber mentioned, the fact that uh, the one parcel is going to be R1 so that we're not concerned about losing that green space. I think the fact that it would go back to R1 if the property were to be sold, I think is, is comforting. Um, I think what's also interesting is that just because it stays R1 does not guarantee that you will get a good neighbor, a neighbor who, uh, for example, I think someone said, uh, um, they, if you had four or five teenagers and they all had a car and they were all coming and going at all hours of the night, um, that could be as big a problem as, and, and you would have absolutely no control over it. Um, I was comforted by the fact that um, in one of the many emails, they mentioned the, the, the strict guidelines that are placed upon the women that are in the facility so that um, they probably have stricter control than um, most parents would even um, have in, in their own home. Um, I liked the fact that I heard that um, if they had parking, they could either park in the garage or in the parking lot so that you're not taking up space on the street. To me, that's really important. If you're trying to get to your home or and the streets all blocked up with parking, that's, that's a concern. So that was comforting to me. Um, I liked the fact that, um, well, the thing is, we are not here to judge um, what um, this particular organization chose within the community, uh, this house versus that house. I think we need to make sure that we're making our decision based on the facts that we have and not um, feelings that we might have. Um, so I feel that the many questions that I received um, have, been, have been addressed um, and I will, be, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rousseau. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I too want to echo a lot of what my cohorts have said, thanking everybody that came. Um, I had a similar like issue like this happen to me. The Dubuque Rescue Mission bought a house that had three lots on it. They tore down the three houses, and, or the one house, and then they built three individual houses. Um, there was a similar hoopla. A lot of neighbors did not like this idea of 10 to 12 <laughs> single unemployed men living right next to them. And the Rescue Mission has done a phenomenal job. I have never had a problem with those folks because they are just a block down for me. So I don't see this being a problem. You, you want to get to know your neighbors? There are staff members here who want to get to know you potentially from, Saint, uh, from Mary's Inn. So I think this is a win-win for the neighborhood. The fact that you could have potential new families moving into the neighborhood, meeting new neighbors. I'm fully supportive of this, the way that it's designed. I don't think there's going to be a problem. So thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Every, every time we have an adversarial rezoning, property values come up. I've heard it over and over again. I appreciate the acknowledgement somebody made that uh, that they're never impacted. We've, we've heard the argument many times. I've never, ever, ever in 18 years sitting on the council seen any evidence of that happening when a rezoning occurred. Um, a number of you mentioned code concerns. Well, we have all kinds of mechanisms to enforce our building safety codes, and we're pretty aggressive about it. And that's not a part of rezoning. That's not the question before us tonight. I'll tell you that I have a personal hierarchy of consideration in zoning matters. And the, the highest preference I'll provide, if I can, is to the owner of the property. Um, historically, it's the, the person's home is their castle. Um, they should have the highest interest in what to do with it to make it a useful property. Um, this organization has sought and found a piece of property that they think um, is applicable to their needs. And I agree with them. I think it's a great piece. In fact, I've, I've been in the house a number of times. Friends of ours lived there a couple of owners ago. Um, so all the other considerations are valid, but I give a little higher weight to the owner of the property. It's their property. They should get to do with it what they want to do within the confines of our zoning law. Um, to my friend's objection to the 30 minute time limit, that's, that wasn't just invented tonight, that's for every public hearing, for every public comment period, um, for a long, long time, and it's part of the policy of this council that we operate under. Most public bodies have a similar um, time constraint. I think the most important precedent um, in deciding whether this is a group home or a maternity home, I said one of the attorneys had to go to Texas to find somebody that would define a maternity home for him. Um, most important precedent happened at the Dubuque City Council table in 2015 when they determined um, through a public open legal process with a great deal of public input, because I was sitting there, that uh, Mary Zinn, this particular organization, was in fact a group home and that that was the statute that applied. So I think it's been adjudicated by this body that has not been challenged in court. I think right now you've got a fabulous neighborhood in and around Churchill Drive. I think next year you will have a fabulous neighborhood in and around Churchill Drive. Please look at this as an opportunity to get to know some new people and be a help. These are young women in, in great distress that are finding their way forward and finding their way to employment, finding their way to education, finding their way to important to citizenship. There are lessons that your kids can learn from them to not repeat their mistakes. There are lessons that they can learn from all of you. And there's an opportunity for all of you to, to enjoy an outstanding neighborhood yesterday and tomorrow. I always ask myself in controversial matters, will anybody be better off if I support this? I absolutely believe a lot of people will be better off if I support this, so I plan to. And yes, I would vote for this next door to my house or across the street. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Wetham. Wally, I'm not gonna let you get out of this without standing up. So we had a lot of great input and points um, that were legal in nature. And so I do hope everyone knows that we, as a council, take those, um, those letters and those legal briefings and we explore them, we ask questions, and um, I do a deep dive on the internet in which sometimes my husband has to put on some guardrails. So, <laughs> Um, one thing that I just wanted to talk about related to the concern of a transient population within an R1 district. Um, Wally, I just want to confirm, my understanding is that any R1 home in the city of Dubuque could be an Airbnb, is that correct? That's correct. So um, Airbnb is kind of more of the commercial term. The legal term in the state of Iowa is called short-term rental. So anyone could rent out their home. It uh, doesn't require a rental license, doesn't require inspection by the city. Um, they're permitted to do so. Um, so anyone can rent out multiple rooms and there is no review oversight with regards to a short-term rental, provided that it's uh, less than 30 days. If it's over 30 days, then it requires a rental license and inspection from the Housing and Community Development Department. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, 
shared with us um, was related to a term called spot zoning. Um, and so I wondered if you would for us just give some examples of um, what, what an example of spot zoning is. So uh, spot zoning gets thrown a lot around quite a bit. Um, a lot of people view spot zoning as this is all zoned one thing and they're gonna come in and just create one, one piece of property, is gonna get rezoned to something that's permitted. Um, as been described through multiple cases and you've had a lot of documentation, I've read through all the information that's being provided to us. There is case law that's been provided at the state level with regards to spot zoning. Not all spot zonings are illegal. Um, there's an ability to review those, make sure that there's a reasonable um, concern with regards to um, you know, the impact of the property and the surrounding properties. Um, the request before you tonight, specifically with this one, is um, the property is residential in nature. Um, so this rezoning request is actually still going to be defined as a single family residential land use, which is what the current um, comprehensive plan has identified the property as. Um, an example of a spot zone, and it's really, really up to the court sometimes we can talk about is um, if someone were to come in and throw a commercial property on this property, you can make arguments that it's a spot zone. There may be reasonings for it to allow it as a, as a legal um, spot zone. So case in point, you know, we had the case with the Dyersville with the Field of Dreams. That was an ag zone going to a commercial zone. Two major different changes in the land use was still upheld as a, as a legal um, spot zone at that location. So um, there's just a lot of debate and a lot of discussion over spot zoning. Um, it's not an easy answer to, um, or not an easy question to answer per se. But yeah, I mean, in this case, um, staff's opinion is not, it would not be an illegal spot zone. I was not here in 2015, of course, when this was um, mm -hmm. discussed regarding the Elbo Bel Belboa Drive property. Um, but since I've been on council for the last 18 months on 32nd Street, we had an R3 placed within R1 designation. In fact, R1, R3, R1, R3 um, on 32nd. Um, additionally, there are um, a lot of great mixed use neighborhoods. And if there's anything that seems to equate to our comprehensive plan, actually, boy, I don't think I could think of an example better than this. So thank you for your input. I, I do want to have just a few more questions, but Wally, I won't need you anymore. Okay. Thank you. Um, so one thing is clear to me that the mission is bigger than one neighborhood or one property. And life example is the most powerful lesson that we can provide to our children. With so many children in this neighborhood, what an incredibly beautiful life lesson to demonstrate welcoming these young women to be your own neighbors. Women who are being nurtured and mentored by an organization that cares so deeply for them. I hope that these women will be shown the respect and kindness that Dubuque is known to have on their new location on Church Hill. I very much appreciate everyone's feedback. Please know that we read everything you sent us. I absolutely intend to support this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wevel. Well, um, let, me, let me begin first by saying that just sincerely how much I appreciate everyone being here and everyone reaching out to us who has reached out to us um, on both sides of this argument. Uh, this is, I hope you see, you know, we, we've, we've made up our minds here um, up until you get to me. Um, and that's been done through a lot of work over this time to be able to look through all this information. Um, there, I, I can just tell you from working with this council, there's nobody here that, that makes these decisions um, in a way that isn't thoughtful. It, it definitely takes some time and effort on our part to, to do this. Uh, but we don't get to make good decisions unless we have good information. And we've received a lot of that from you. This, honestly, it's discussions like this that really give me the most hope in, in our community. But I, And I know this sounds a little highfalutin, but it really in our country. I mean, we fight a lot. You ever notice? Like we're fighting all the time. And sometimes we have to have really tough discussions. And a lot of ways, a community is just like a very large family. And we have to have really difficult discussions sometimes about difficult topics. Nothing gets more difficult in this room than when we have to talk about rezoning. 
I've never seen something that's actually tougher than having to talk about rezoning and changing somebody's neighborhood. And I get why. Our neighborhood is not, not just our castle, it's our sanctuary. This is, this is where we are. This is, this is who we are. We know our neighbors, especially those of you that have lived here for a long time. You're not just neighbors, you're family, you're a true community within a community. That's really important that you've built that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you have. And I think it's really important that um, we find ways to make sure that that continues when we get the opportunity to do that. We have to take zoning seriously as a city. Have you ever been through a community that doesn't? You get a chance to see what that looks like? It's, it's a mess. I, uh, I'm not gonna mention the state, but I was driving somewhere outside of Iowa recently and going through some pretty small towns that clearly had either no or very lackadaisical zoning ordinances. And it's, it's pretty messy. You have things happening that just simply shouldn't happen, um, and along with the code violations that were talked about and things like that. It makes a community not feel like a community. It makes it not feel like a place. When we talk about zoning in this way, and that we're doing tonight, we have to make sure that we are looking at the uses of the neighborhood and the places around there and what it's really going to be and how a change in that zoning could potentially affect things. You know, it, it's one thing to talk about the mission of, of Mary's Inn, and I appreciate what you do. I think, it, I think it's a good mission. And I do not in any way mean to be flippant when I move right past it and say, it's not really the issue in front of us tonight. It's not so much what your mission is and the work that you do, why you made the choice of this house over another, um, the lives that you've really impacted. Those are great stories and I appreciate hearing them, I really do. But from a zoning standpoint, what we need to consider here is what is this place going to do to the neighborhood when we change zoning in this way? What's it really going to look like? How is it going to fit? And I have to tell you, you know, looking through all this, hearing the discussion about spot zoning, considering those arguments very seriously, actually. Um, I spent most of yesterday spending a lot less time looking at football and thinking about understanding spot zoning backwards and forwards. And I, and I, and I appreciate that because some of those games are really terrible to watch. So it, it really has been helpful for me from an educational standpoint to think about what that means for our community. And we have to be careful not to, not to do that in an illegal fashion because it can be harmful to a neighborhood when you, you make too much of a change that doesn't, that doesn't work right. Um, I, I do get concerned about that sometimes and even some of the decisions we made in the past, you know, I still wonder, are they, or were they the right thing to do? In this one, I gotta tell you, I'm just not seeing that many red flags to me that say that this is going to be something that's going to be um, detrimental to the neighborhood in the long term. I understand the concerns of the neighbors, I really do. And whoever it was, and I, I'm sorry, my notes are all messed up. Whoever it was that, uh, that mentioned, you know, what would you do in your own neighborhood? I think that's a really important question for somebody sitting up here to think about. What would we want in our own neighborhood if we were gonna, if we were gonna do this? And, um, and I do think about that. It isn't the most important thing oftentimes for me, but it is something that I think we need to be able to empathize with and think about. Um, and I gotta tell you, I've had some bad neighbors. I don't know if anybody else has had some. I won't name names, but I mean, there've been some doozies, right? And um, they, lived in, they lived in houses just like me. I mean, they, they lived in apartments right next door to my apartment. You know, they, they, were, they were just there like I was. They just weren't that great at living next to people. And to be honest with you, having a neighbor like, I, I, like we've seen come in to, for this rezoning here in Mary's Inn, I, I would love to have that neighbor in my neighborhood. I think they'd be great at it. I hope they keep the buddy bench in the, in, the, in the park. I think that's a great idea to have something like that in a neighborhood to be able to welcome neighbors and, and talk to each other. Um, real quick last story and then I'm gonna move on. Um, and this happened in a neighborhood not quite in Dubuque but very close. Um, somebody close to me told me about some neighbors that moved in recently and they did something very unique. The, the couple was actually from another country and apparently in their culture it's more, um, it's, it's more normal to when you move into a home, you invite everybody in the neighborhood into your home. So they sort of opened up and had an open house and put a sign in their yard and said, come on in. Anybody who wants to come in, come on in. And by the end of the day, the kids were all in the backyard running around together and like the parents weren't even supervising them anymore because everybody knew each other by the end of the day. I, I, I can't believe I've lived this long and I've never heard that before. I'd never seen somebody do that in any neighborhood that I lived in. And I, and I think it's a great idea. So I, I don't intend to move anytime soon, but if I ever do again, I, I would definitely do that to invite all the neighbors into the home. What I hope here, uh, because I'm, I'm going to support this as well with the rest of my, my council members here, that's what I've heard everybody voice. And what I hope here is that as we do, um, we have a neighborhood that is, is, 
is able to find itself in a new way and continue to be that same neighborhood that it's been for a very long time with good neighbors who care about each other and know each other and look out for each other and each other's children. And I hope that we can, we can see that happen. And I actually have a whole lot of faith based on what I've heard today that that's exactly what's gonna happen. You're, you're, really, you're really good people. You know the reason I love living in Dubuque. So thank you very much for being here and for, for having this discussion with us tonight. Um, I'm gonna call this vote. If you wouldn't mind, please holding tight while um, I, I have Trish read the roll and we have the vote. And then I will take a moment. I know a lot of you are probably ready to go home. If you wanna stick around and party with us till about midnight or so, feel free to stick around. <laughs> but. Um, we, we'll be here, but I, now I'll, I will give us a, a few minutes to, to clear the room out and, and walk out um, in an orderly fashion, of course. So, Trish, if you wouldn't mind, please call the roll. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion passes 7-0. That was a motion to waive the three readings. We actually have to have another vote immediately after that for the final vote. Mr. So Mayor. I will ask for a motion. Mr. Jones? I move final consideration and pass it to the ordinance. Second. Got a motion by Jones, second by Resnick. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. All right, we'll take a moment here to just... Uh, let folks leave if they want to, and then we'll get back to business.
everyone. Council's going to get back to work here, so we're going to be moving on. Thank you, Lenny. Have a good night. Unmuted. She's got it. All right. Trish, if you could read us into the next public hearing, please. Public hearing number two is request to rezone property located at 25 Bissell Lane. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting in which it is to be finally passed to be suspended. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Uh, Wally, please. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council, Planning Services Director Wally Wormont. The request before you tonight is to rezone a parcel located on Bessel Lane from OR Office Residential to C3 General Commercial. Um, including your packet is a vicinity map that kind of shows the location of the two parcels in question. Um, the, re the property immediately to the south is zone C3 General Commercial, and the property immediately to the east of the property is zone C3 Commercial. So this would be an expansion of the existing C3 district. Um, the subject property consists of two parcels, both of which are vacant. As recently as 2020, there was a house on the north property um, the, we have what we call Sanborn fire insurance maps, which show historical footprints of buildings throughout time. Um, there was previously a house located on the southern lot that has been removed over, since the past time. Um, when we talk about this location, there has been significant changes to this neighborhood, such as the creation of the Locust Street connector, the conversion of Dodge Street into a four-lane freeway, um, led to the demolition of numerous homes and structures, and a dram dramatic change to the character of the neighborhood and actually the fact there will be eventually a, a, another bridge coming through this location as well um, with regards to um, the second bridge that will go over the Mississippi River at this location. So um, the request is pretty straightforward. It's just a request to rezone from um, office, um, excuse me, office residential to C3 General Commercial. All property owners were notified within 200 feet. We did receive a letter that was included in your, in your packet of information. Um, the, the Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing. Um, at the public hearing, the applicant got up and spoke in favor of the request. He noted he is looking at doing a contractor shopping yard, which is pretty much going to comprise of, of uh, think of a residential garage built on the property to store materials for his business and for some other property. But one thing that the Zoning Advisory Commission looks at is just not just the contractor shopping yard. They have to look at the overall C3 zoning um, regulations. Um, it would require a site plan. They'll have to go through the development review team to review the setbacks, size, scale, and screening requirements from the residential property that would be required of the property. And um, that's all I have. Um, so by a vote of five to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends that the City Council approve the rezoning request as submitted. Thank you very much, Wally. And I'll just say quick before I read us in here, thank you to everyone for your patience this evening. We know it was a long time. Um, but we appreciate that. And, and Alexis, special thank you to you back there for helping to direct traffic. Really appreciate that. <laughs> we are in a public hearing to consider uh, rezoning of property located at 25 Bissell Lane from OR Office Residential to C3 General Commercial Zoning District. And the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Good evening. Uh, I'm Corey Ranson, uh, 8190 Southern Hill Circle. And I put the uh, permit in for the change of OR to C3. Okay. Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you. Do you have any other comments for us? No. Nope. Okay. Unless you got any questions. Or okay. okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other public input this evening? All right. Do we have anyone virtually? No. Thank you. Anything else from the city clerk's office? All right. Back to the table for discussion then. I will agree with Wally. This does seem pretty straightforward. Um, also in a neighborhood that has changed quite a bit, so it does seem to fit with that. Okay. Seeing no discussion or questions, uh, the motion here is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel, aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. 
Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Moving on to public hearing number three, request to rezone property at uh, 2000 Radford Road. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, and I further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Wethel. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Wethel. Wally, please. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council, Planning Services Director Wally Wormont, in case you've forgotten about me in the previous two cases. <laughs> um, <laughs> the request before you tonight is a rezone property from a PUD uh, with Plan C, with PC Plan Commercial designation to OC Office Commercial. Usually unique. We don't really have a lot of PUDs that are going back to a traditional rezoning, um, but we'll kind of step through that process for you. Um, located um, before you is the vicinity map of the property. This property is located next to the Pizza Ranch, located off of Radford Road. Um, the applicant um, has received actually low-income housing tax credits from the state of Iowa uh, in order to build a, a low-income housing apartment complex on the property. And we do notify all property owners within 200 feet of the property for the rezoning. We did have not re received any uh, opposition to that request from any of the neighbors. Um, in addition to that, um, we require that the applicant actually have a neighborhood meeting. So we had a neighborhood meeting uh, prior to our Zoning Advisory Commission meeting where everyone's notified. We provide them a list of people who will, be, who will receive our notice. Um, we had at the Pizza Ranch, and I think he had a couple people show up um, with regards to that as the developer um, to answer some of those questions. Um, so this is a rezoning uh, to rezone a part of an existing parcel. Uh, it will be to allow 48, a 48 unit low to modern income housing project. Um, the development would include a three story multifamily residential building with approximately 100 uh, surface parking spaces. And the development will require review for this, through the city's development review team. Um, we actually take conceptual plans, which is this is what's part of um, for this. And this has actually been vetted already by the development review team. We want to make sure what's being proposed and the scale, the size of the building, the off-street parking, specifically the access to the property um, will meet some of our requirements before we actually go through and rezone the process. We've actually have done that, um, and they've addressed a lot of the concerns from the DRT. However, there will be a full submittal of site plan review that will go before them um, in the future. This is just a map of the area, the, um, the site area and the neighborhood. Um, we also have to look at subdividing the property. So this is just a conceptual subdivision plat that shows how the property will be subdivided. Um, it'll have frontage on Rafford Road, which would be a shared access drive. That access drive will be able to provide access to a lot, uh, future lot one of two. So we're not gonna have multiple curb cuts along Rafford Road at this location. Um, as I indicated, we have not received any uh, public input with regards to the proposal re rezoning request. And, um, I also just wanted to note specifically uh, with the rezoning, um, this is a good example of transitional rezoning. Um, off us to the right of the property that you're looking at, we have single family homes that are zoned R1 residential, and then we go to R3, which is townhomes, uh, duplexes, multifamily residential, and then we're stepping it up um, to the uh, rezoning for uh, multifamily residential, and it also buffers that uh, commercial property from the residences. In addition to it is a location where it's on a bus route. Um, we have a middle school located directly across the street. It's in a walkable neighborhood. Um, and once again, uh, we're looking at providing additional housing in our community. I can't uh, reiterate enough that we're going to be short or we're on pace to have over the required amount. Um, but as we know, we have to go through the process, move forward, and when um, the shovel's in the ground and it gets building, I'll believe it. So that's all I have unless you guys have any questions. Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider rezoning property at 2000 Radford Road from planned unit development with PC plan commercial designation to OC office commercial and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Anyone here have any public input on this item? Seeing none in chambers, anyone virtual? No. Thank you. Anything else from the city clerk's office? Okay. All right, back to the table for discussion then. Seeing and hearing none. Okay. So the motion here is to uh, receive and file, waive the three readings. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Cabanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. 
Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second okay. by Wethel. Thank you. We have a motion by Roussel, second by Wethel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number four is request to rezone property at 3465 Asbury Road. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement of the proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting of which it is to be finally passed to be suspended. Second by Farber. Motion by Jones, second by Farber. Wally, please, again. <laughs> Good evening. Wally, we're my planning services manager. Um, the request before you is uh, to rezone property from a PU, PUD with PC, just like we had before. So for, however, we're gonna downzone this to a C3 general commercial district. Um, the request before you is being uh, requested by uh, Dutrack. They're currently going through a multi-million dollar remodel of their property. Um, the rezoning and to PC was established back in the uh, early, late 1980s uh, when Dutrack was kind of out there by themselves and there was residences that were getting built up around the property. There was concerns with visibility and the impact of the commercial property and the enjoying property owners. Um, there was multiple requests um, to have it placed as a PUD at that time. Um, to be honest with you, we typically don't have PUDs uh, small in scale um, for this property. Ideally, it would have been better off to be zone C3 with commercial, to be honest, with conditions. Um, with regards to the request. Um, however, that's what they're looking at going through. They're looking at rezoning the property from plans commercial to C3 uh, with conditions. The Zoning Advisory Commission had a public hearing. Um, they reviewed the request. There's a lot of discussion with regards to screening and sign requirements for the property. Um, currently, the way it sits, uh, the property is bound by OS sign requirements, which really limits the amount of signage for a building of this size and scale. Um, by rezoning it to a C3C, it actually opens it up and provides them additional signage, which is the same that's being offered to several other bank buildings located in the immediate area at the location um, for the property. Um, as I mentioned, the Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing, and by a vote of four to zero, they recommend the City Council approve the rezoning request with the condition of maintaining the screen requirement, which was in the existing planning development, um, which was PC planned commercial. Um, just like before you, where we had the memorandum of agreement that has been signed um, by Dutrack, um, the uh, individual who's responsible for that, which would be the operations facilities manager, Kim Adams, who's present with us tonight um, with regards to the property. And then once again, we could also reclassify the subject property if they do not follow through on the conditions. Um, the, the city council has the ability to um, go through and start rezoning proceedings back to the previous approved PUD at that location. Um, that's all I have, unless you guys have any questions. Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider a request to rezone property at 3465 Asbury Road from planned unit development with PC planned commercial designation to a C3 general commercial and Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval with the condition of maintaining the screening requirements within the existing planned unit development. Um, do we have any public input on this? Or do we have more staff? Nope. Information? I would be here for the public. You're here for the public input. All right. Thank you very much. I'm trying to cover it. It's I'm, not I'm working, so sorry for my, my confusion. Yes, so <laughs> That's okay. please. I'm actually going to uh, hand out a little bit of a bigger area for the map. Um, Thank you. Alexis Steger, 2480 Wheatland Drive. Um, so um, with the zoning request, I actually, um, C3 opens this property up to a much bigger um, future use than it currently is and currently needs for the banking purposes that Dutrack is requiring, including signage. Um, a C2, which actually, if you read the Unified, De Unified Development Code, is appropriate for this area. Um, a C2 would provide a ability for a 25 foot in the air sign that is not attached to the building and a 300 square foot uh, sign. We could also provide a variance for something larger than that if, uh, if is needed by the bank and we think that that is uh, uh, something that we want to do. Uh, I'm gonna start off with the request itself that went to commission. 
Um, so presented to the commission was that this is a commercial corridor. And as you can see, that this actually is not a commercial corridor. Um, it's definitely not a C3 corridor. It is a C2, uh, two parcels next to it, which are C2. Both those corridors were built in the 1950s and 60s, which was before we did the PUD for the property itself. So nothing has changed in this area. Everything else was residential. Those were commercial. They were built before the do track was there. Nothing has changed. The um, other piece of, that was presented to the commission, which also was incorrect information, was that um, the usage for this area wouldn't change. For, so C3 has 57 uh, different permitted uses, whereas a C2 has 24. So more than double the permitted uses, including things that wouldn't be conducive to be around a residential neighborhood, such as a construction yard. So for future use, Dutrack doesn't plan to put a construction yard there, but Dutrack may not also be there long term. So when we're talking about zoning, we're thinking about long term uses. In a residential area, those are things that you do not want in the area, and it's not just not something that was presented to the commission um, as readily as it should have been. Um, also in the information that came from the staff was that Asbury was considered a mini arterial. Nowhere in any of our documents on our, on our website, on our comprehensive plan, anywhere is Asbury uh, designated as an arterial, a mini arterial, a minor artery, a major roadway, none of those things. Um, also searching for historic documents from the city council, no results for mini arterial. The UDC, and the reason why this is important, is that your unified development code says that for a C3, the use needs to require a highway or an arterial. So this is not an appropriate use for a C3. A C2 would no, not need those things for the road. As we road, obviously, is nothing like JFK, whereas in our comprehensive plan, JFK says that's a minor arterial. That's a four-lane road with a turn lane in the middle, cameras at every intersection, Signals at every intersection, nothing like Asbury. Asbury has, still has stop signs at some of the intersections. Doesn't have cameras at every intersection. Doesn't even have high tech signals for detecting cars. Um, Dutrack has other ways to uh, get what they need from this. Uh, it is good that our, our businesses are committing a lot of money to the area. It looks way better. I mean, I live in the area. I pass the building every single day. It looks so much better even under construction. Um, and we don't want to mitigate the efforts that they're making and just turn them down. However, C3 wasn't the appropriate use for this property. It's still, uh, it was parceled as 10 residential properties when it was taken over. This is a section in which it's surrounded by three properties that are, or th three sides are residential. It has curb cuts right directly across from it for residential driveways. This shouldn't be something that is C3 that can allow for many uses. Um, one of the other things to consider um, is that our comprehensive plan, Chapter 10, Land Use Recommendations, says that we should ensure that commercial development does not impact the quality of life to adjacent neighborhoods. I do not think Dutrack is going to do that. However, in C3, if Dutrack were to leave this area and it was zoned Z3, C3 can be a tattoo parlor, it can be a bar, it can be a construction yard or zone, um, it can just be gravel pit, basically, and none of those uses would be conducive to be have residential structures, R1 and R3, directly surrounding it. Um, C2 does what we need it to. We can change it from a PUD to a C2, fits the corridor, makes more sense. And that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis, for your comments. Other comments? Other public input this evening? It, Could I have the term? Absolutely, yeah. Come on up. <clears throat> uh, Kim Adams with Two Truck Credit Union, 3465 Asbury Road. Um, the, the one point I'd like to make is um, she stated it's not considered an arterial corridor, yet there's over 13,000 vehicles that pass Two Track every single day. And so um, the reason we were looking to do this is because um, several of our competitors in Dubuque, ha and there's obviously a lot of competition in the financial industry, uh, have the abilities to have their signage, their lighting, um, everything else th that we cannot. We're just trying to stay relevant. That's the reason we're investing in the community. That's the reason we invested uh, over $2.3 into the property we're doing. 
Um, and we're just looking to, to utilize all the traffic that passes through there, which is why we're looking for you know, better signage than we have currently. So, um, you know, track has been in business for 77 years. We've been in that area for over 35 years, investing in that area. We're not going anywhere. I, we had no opposition from neighbors, you know. Um, we have no issue with continuing with the barrier around the building. We believe it should be there. It's a safety uh, for our staff, for, and it's great for the neighbors. The neighbors love the, the barrier that we put up, the new one with everything. We try to do what we can to make it uh, good neighbors always. And so, um, I just hope you consider giving us the option. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, for your comments. Any others this evening? All right. Anyone virtually? No. Okay. City Clerk's Office, nothing extra. All right. Back to the table for discussion then. Mr. Mr. Resnick. Uh, I, I think um, uh, I, I appreciate a lot of the people getting in the weeds, and there's a lot of uh, information and things to consider. And I, the thing is that I really think that the Zoning Advisory Commission should be the one to really get into the weeds. I appreciate uh, all the great facts uh, tonight uh, and the research that goes into it. Um, uh, I'm not going to, you know, we, we don't confirm or deny, you know, people's facts, and, uh, but they need, to be, they need to be brought out to that citizen commission it's a four to zero vote. Uh, they felt, I guess, pretty strongly that this is the right thing to do. So I'm going to support our commission. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. While I'm waiting for anybody else's questions, Wally, if, if you wouldn't mind, I, I, I would like to ask. So um, this, is, this is an interesting argument. You know, so biggest differences between C2 and C3. I mean, why ask for... Aside from, you know, I, and I, um, Ms. Adams pointed out, competitors are C3. Signage was a big concern there. Um, but if, why C3 versus C2? Is the signage that much different? To, sure, the signage, different? there is a difference. And actually, if it was rezoned to C2, it would be, they would actually have less signage than what they would be allowed under the current PUD requirements for office service. Um, we did look at rezoning to C2. If it was a rezoned C2, it would actually be reducing the amount of signage that would be permitted for this business at this location. It was brought to the attention of the, the, um, the Zoning Advisory Commission, the staff report. Um, we did note, however, for approved, the proposed rezoning would increase the quantity of permitted uses to 57 in the C3 zoning district compared to the 19 permitted uses in the current planned commercial district. Um, the commission may wish to consider a rezoning to C3C to limit potential substantial impacts to neighboring properties and uses. And staff has attached a list of C3 permitted uses and conditional uses for the commission's review, including your packet. You can kind of see that we've um, highlighted um, some areas that are green that are kind of the dual purposes between the C3. They did recommend a conditional rezoning for that screening requirement. Um, uh, it seems like the concern would just be, you know, continue the bank operation. It's up to you um, if you want to further limit those uh, uses. If you do so, that would require us to do another memorandum of agreement, which they've already signed, and come back before you in another public hearing. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know, are all other financial institutions like banks and credit unions in our community zoned C3? Is that a, a they're, fair? Um, they're typically, so when you think of uh, minor arterial corridors like JFK, um, Dodge Street, Highway 20, at, um, Asbury Road in some cases, um, those are all zoned C3, downtown C4 types of zoning. We have a few properties that are zoned C2 that are bank properties, but um, we, we really have them in all different types of zones, so. Okay. And in fact, you're going to hear a text amendment about another option later today. Yeah. Future work. Yeah, this Any other questions? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, I guess I'll just say, for for my part, um, I I appreciate I appreciate the comments. I appreciate the the discussion on this. Um, it it does seem that the um, zoning advisory commission has taken a, a good look at this already, and um, I appreciate the work that staff has done. It sounds like we've looked at C two as a as a possibility and decided that that wasn't the appropriate use at this time. So, um, given what I have before me here, I don't see a reason to to go against that at this time. 
All right, well with that, um, we have a motion to receive and file. Waive the three readings. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and pass it to the ordinance. Second by Wethel. <clears throat> and a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. <clears throat> motion passes 7 0. Moving on to public hearing number five, approving the development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and HG APT LLC. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Sprink. A motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. We got a motion by Sprink, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Ma Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors was recommending City Council adopt the attached resolution approving a development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and HGAPT LLC, providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations. The key elements of the development agreement include the following. The developer will make a capital investment of approximately $1.5 million to rehabilitate the facility. Number two, developer must create 18 market rate residential rental units. Number three, developer will receive 15 years of tax increment financing incentives of the form of semi-annual rebates. Tax increment financing incentives are estimated to not exceed $393,194. Now, I do have to interject something here. So uh, we made some of these tax increment financing estimates, uh, not taking into consideration the fact that the state has now changed multifamily residential, they eliminated that zoning classification, or I'm sorry, not zoning classification, that taxing, property taxing classification, and made all multi-residential uh, residential properties. So they're now subject to the residential rollback. And so this number doesn't calculate the residential rollback. I don't see it being any problem being in an agreement like this because it says it shall not exceed that number. Well, it's not going to, because it's not gonna come close to that number. Now, there's no reason for the developer to be concerned about that, because when you do uh, tax increment financing rebates, um, you're only allowed to rebate about 90% of the property taxes paid, because you're not allowed to rebate any taxes that were approved by a referendum like uh, some of the school taxes are. Um, you're not allowed to uh, rebate the pebble levy, which is the school maintenance levy, and you're not allowed to rebate any debt levies of any of the taxing districts. So it's actually to the benefit of the developer to pay less taxes up front and get rebated 90% of the lesser payment than to pay a higher tax, which they wouldn't pay anyway. It's just a it's just a miscalculation <coughs> of the amount. Um, so anyway, that 393-194 is certainly a not to exceed number because it's probably about 60% of that number, somewhere around there. Number four, and I will point out that is also in some of the other public hearings you've already set for later, and we'll try and correct those with the developer in the memos before those public hearings. Number four, city to award a downtown housing incentive grant in an amount of $180,000, which is $10,000 times 18 units. Number five, city to award a planning and design grant, facade grant, and financial consultant grant not cumulatively exceed $35,000. Number six, city of Dubuque will amend the greater downtown urban renewal district plan to accommodate the issuance of tax increment financing incentives. The development agreement requires the developer to accept applications from prospective tenants with housing choice vouchers, or commonly called Section 8 vouchers, that are otherwise qualified prospective tenants. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider a development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and HGAPT LLC providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Uh, 
Hi, I'm uh, Josh Manders, 1495 South Grand View, Dubuque, Iowa. Um, we, uh, I, with my brother and sister back there, are the owners and developers of the property. Um, we bought them both in 2020 as vacant buildings. Um, we redid the convent building into 10 um, apartments, which have maintained 100% occupancy since they've been done. Um, you guys were behind that project. We got a lot of the same um, grants and stuff from you guys then, and we're just basically applying for the same stuff again now. Um, we apply, or we're happy to announce that we use pretty much all local contractors. Everybody we use um, resides in the city of Dubuque, except for our sprinkler company, which is out of Iowa City, um, basically just because Dubuque doesn't have one, but the contractors that we use actually live in Dubuque um, for the company, but everything else is local, and we try to stay as local as we can, and we're just here to ask that you support us again, and as we put 18 more apartments in, essentially. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions for me or not. Well, thank you, Josh, for your comments. If we do, we'll, we'll let you know. Perfect. All right, thank you. I worked all day and sat like for the last three hours, so I'm moving slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine Sorensen, 2613 Jackson. So Holy Ghost is right around the corner. I pass it every day. Um, and I agree they did a fantastic job with the convent. That was done shortly after I moved here. Um, the only thing I'm asking, I know you mentioned Section 8 housing, and I'm just concerned. From what I'm finding online, this might be actually less square footage than the convent. So when you're talking 18 apartments and we're looking at that, and, you saw, and I did like the idea of Section 8, but maybe we can start looking at when we're negotiating is starting to look at, okay, what are we talking about size-wise? And what are we talking about cost-wise? Because Section 8 comes back and the landlord can fix whatever price they want, and then we pay for it, and then the tenant obviously pays the difference. So, but I did like the idea, I did appreciate the fact that there would be some low income, fixed income apartments in this building, especially since Central does have a bus stop, and a lot of them need a bus stop. Um, but at the same time, negotiating a little bit better so we know exactly what we're getting and not just getting, you know, 600 square feet at $1,200 a month or something. And, you know, I'm just looking at the neighborhood and, and seeing what we can do to try to get, you know, we all like good tenants. I do too, you know. So thank you. Good night. <laughs> thank you, Catherine, for your comment. Any others this evening? Okay. Do we have any virtual? No. All right. Anything else from the city clerk's office? Okay. All right. Back to the table then for discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Sprank. Um, I'm going to fully support this. I'm looking forward to having more apartments and more housing options in my neighborhood. So um, I'm looking forward to hopefully the rest of my cohorts agree with me. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sprank. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Farmer. Ditto, Mr. Sprank. <laughs> There's a fine use of the ditto right there. <laughs> Right. Yeah, Ms. Wethel, go ahead. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking a vacant building that is a beautiful building, a piece of history in Dubuque, and doing something so meaningful with it. I am grateful for um, your intention of using <clears throat> local contractors. What a great example. And uh, thank you again. Mr. Jones? Uh, your previous project speaks for itself, so congratulations. Full speed ahead. I do want to offer um, just a clarification, just so so the public's aware of kind of our, our process here with the, the development agreements. So if you if you're um, if you're keeping score, or I should say, if you're paying attention, um, the uh, the development agreements, some of them, they're, they're, we have a pretty clear standard way that we operate when it comes to these, and the the reason for that is we have a very clear. Uh, goal as a city council, and we said it last year, that we want to incentivize the creation of housing. So what you see there oftentimes is that we are, the, the things we are putting in place is to try and help developers like, like you all uh, to be able to move this, this type of projects forward. Now, they don't currently specify what type of housing we are actually talking about. Um, we will incentivize lots of different types of housing, market rate housing, low income housing, 
um, uh, what we might call affordable, which is a little bit more, you know, it kind of runs the, the gamut between those two. Um, lots of different types of housing, uh, both, you know, in actual uh, standalone homes, multifamily housing, apartments, all these different things. That's kind of the goal here. But one of the things that we have made clear is that if you are going to sign a development agreement with the, with the city of Dubuque, that we will require you to accept Section 8 or um, housing choice vouchers. Whether or not those housing choice vouchers will be easily used by the, um, the folks who have those in hand at certain different apartments, that will depend on the price of the apartment. So we, we recognize that, but we also think it's important that we make sure that those development agreements say that. So I just wanted to point that out because that was kind of uh, what Ms. Sorensen was bringing up and we've had some discussions about that in here. But I think this is still moving in the right direction. Uh, I, I completely agree. This is great to see buildings that are currently empty becoming living spaces for people in key parts of town, a place that really needs it in the North End. So I know Mr. Sprank is happy. Um, we hear from him a lot about housing needs in the North End. We appreciate it very much. So with that, our motion here is to receive and file and adopt this resolution. So Trish, would you call the roll please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number six is Moss Park Lake Pump Station Culvert Repair Project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council adopt the attached resolution approving the plan, specifications, form of contract, and construction estimate of $586,000 for the Moss Park Lake Pump Station Culvert Repair Project. The Mars Moss Park Lake Pump Station Culvert Repair Project involves the lining of the culvert that allows stormwater runoff to pass from the Moss Lake ponding area under a set of railroad mainline tracks through the flood wall levee system into the Mississippi. Repair of the culvert involves the trenches in installation of approximately 110 lineal feet of a steel slip liner inside the existing culvert, resulting in a new culvert under the railroad tracks, partially through the levee. In addition to lining the existing culvert, the work includes the construction of a permanent coffer dam and concrete apron, concrete walls, and a stop log level control system on the interior side of the flood wall levee system, which will both facilitate the lining process and allow for maintenance of the culvert once complete. The city has a pending claim into the Iowa Community Assurance Pool for making the permanent repairs of the culvert that will offset the city's cost to a certain extent as determined by ICAP. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider approving the plan specification form of contract and construction estimate of $586,000 for the Moss Park Lake Pump Station Culvert Repair Project and the city manager's recommending approval. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one here, anyone virtually? No. Thank you. Nope. Nothing from the city clerk's office. Back to the table for discussion. Seeing none. Motion is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number seven is request to amend PUD zone C at 7495 Chavanel <clears throat> Road of the Dubuque Industrial Center West planned unit development. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. <clears throat> I move to receive and file, and further move that a requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meters, meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Farber. Motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Back to you, Wally. Good evening, Mayor and City Council, Planning Services Director Wally Wermott. Um, the request before you is to amend Zone C of the Dubuque Industrial Center West Planning Unit Development to allow an animal hospital or clinic a kennel and a pet daycare or grooming as permitted uses. Um, our current Dubuque Industrial Center West is a planning unit development, it's a, has a PI, an industrial designation, and it encompasses a large property along Chavanel Road. And that's actually broken up into multiple zones. Included in your packet is the, the ordinance that's drafted. Uh, what we're looking at here is just amending uh, zone C, which is located um, along Synergy Court. There's a small portion along um, Chavanel Road. 
Um, with regards to an existing building um, that used to house the Ho um, Hodges office building, um, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Katie Merkus, who's been waiting diligently over <laughs> here to probably speak with regards to it. Um, they're looking at expanding services. So as you look at the Dubuque Industrial Center West, uh, we recently amended the PUD to include child care um, located in the former Bedline building located at the, uh, along Chavanaugh Road, actually very close to this property. Um, what we're looking at doing here is amending this district to allow <coughs> doggy daycare and veterinarian services and some other things. And we're seeing more and more services being able to be provided to those workers. Um, as they work in the Dubuque Industrial Center District. They have the ability to come in and drop off their children for daycare, drop off their dog. Um, the other thing about it is this is a good location in planning staff's um, opinion just because when we have kennels and dogs, they bark, they make noise. Um, we're located in the middle of an industrial district, which makes noise. Um, so um, and the ability to, for walking paths and everything associated with the uh, the, uh, with the doggy daycare and the pet grooming and the veterinarian clinic and everything that's associated with it. Um, the Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing. We notified everybody inside the entire PUD um, zone, which is quite a few uh, property owners, and everyone within 200 feet outside of that zone when we do amendments to PUD. And by a vote of five to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends that the City Council approve the request, and just a civil majority vote is all it's needed in order to concur with that approval. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Wally. The, uh, we are in a public hearing to consider a request to amend the PUD Zone C at 7495 Chavanel Road of the Dubuque Industrial Center West planned unit development to allow animal hospital or clinic, kennel, and pet daycare or grooming as permitted uses, and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have any public input on this item? My name is Dr. Katie Merkus. I live at 13167 Somerset Hills Drive, and I submitted the request to amend the PUD. I graduated veterinary school in 2013. I'm a Dubuque native and moved back and started my own practice in 2014. I initially worked as a mobile practitioner doing house calls, and in 2021, I opened my first brick and mortar as I started offering more holistic services like acupuncture, chiropractic, um, rehabilitation for dogs and cats. Um, I have outgrown my space currently, and there is a huge demand in the area for any kind of dog service, um, including cats, but we're talking mostly dogs. Um, since COVID, so many people got animals, and it's been great for my business, but really it, there's my clients are having a hard time finding boarding, grooming, daycare services. There's literally no boarding facilities really in Dubuque. So although this would be a moderately sized um, boarding facility, I think it would be great to keep these dogs in Dubuque, keep um, the money in Dubuque. Um, so I'm looking to get this PUD amended so I can expand my business into a monstrous business, monstrous building have a ton of dogs, it's gonna be awesome. Um, and thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Right. Thank you, Dr. Marcus, for your comments. Anyone else? Anyone virtually? No. City Clerk's office, nothing there? All right, back to the table for discussion. Seeing none, hearing none. All right, um, it seems like a very good use of this space to me, so I appreciate that. All right, the motion here, I'm having trouble keeping track. We got so many public hearings today. I got the motion here is to receive and file, waive the three readings. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Farber? We got a motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number eight is Unified Development Code Text Amendment Request. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that the proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting of which it is to be finally passed to be suspended. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Wally, please. 
Yes, um, the uh, Capra Bank has submitted a text amendment to come before the uh, Zoning Advisory Commission, which they have reviewed and uh, recommend City Council approve. This is in regards to the updating the Unified Development Code to list drive up automated bank teller as a permitted use in a C3 zoning district and as a conditional use in a C4 zoning district and to add drive up automated bank teller to the signage table. So currently we allow these drive up automated bank tellers, which technology has changed, right? Um, a lot of people are not even stepping foot in a bank anymore. They have the ability to pull up to an ATM or an automated bank teller and put their card in and conduct business right out of their car at a location. Um, Capper Bank is, uh, came with the request. They were looking at a certain site in our community. These are typically accessory, allowed as accessory uses to a bank building um, that's actually constructed on the site. So all your drive throughs that you have, those are all accessory to the bank building. But when they're standalone by themselves, um, we currently only allow those in our industrial district. So um, with the change in technology and the demand and the need that we're seeing more and more of these, um, the Capper Bank submitted the text amendment and then the city of Dubuque, uh, the planning services department, also looked at allowing them as, as conditional uses in our C4, which is our downtown commercial zoning district. Uh, conditional use would require it to go before the zoning board adjustment and because there is potential for impacts uh, adjacent to residential property for screening requirements um, and whatnot. Um, so uh, when we look at these requests, the other thing that brought up is what are the sign requirements? Well, in a C3, you can have a pretty substantial large sign for just a bank teller drive up. That's um, so. Staff looked at it. They looked at the, what was proposed by Capper Bank um, in order to establish some um, modern um, um, science um, requirements for this drive up teller, which is 75 square feet with a maximum feet of 20 feet in height. Um, is recommended to avoid these being, um, you know, a large large billboards really <laughs> on a small footprint per se. Um, a lot of times these will be located in what you consider just parking lots and leased areas. They will go through a development review team process because uh, once again, like a drive up coffee shop or a drive through, um, we have to look at queuing. We have to look at how traffic flow is going through. We're not blocking parking spaces. We're not impacting um, the drive aisle access and everything. So. Um, with this text amendment, the, the Zoning Advisory Commission reviewed that. Now, Nancy can. Um, she, she spoke on behalf of that to the Zoning Advisory Commission. She talked about the technology. She provided a lot of information that's included in your packet. Um, and staff summarized that, once again, what we're looking at doing is to allow drive-up automated bank teller as a permitted use in our C3 light industrial, heavy industrial, and modified heavy industrial zoning districts. We're looking at allowing drive up automated bank teller as a conditional use in a C4 and a commercial recreational zoning district, uh, which currently it's a conditional use in a commercial recreational zoning district, and to adopt a new condition for the establishment of drive up automated bank tellers as a conditional use, because um, we didn't have any conditions previously spelled out in chapter eight of our unified development code. And then amend the irrelevant zoning district signage tables to limit the size and scale of the drive up automated bank teller signage. Um, there was no public comment at the uh, public hearing, um, and the Zoning Advisory Commission, by a vote of five to zero, recommends the City Council approve the request, and a simple majority vote is needed for City Council to approve this request. That's all I have. Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider a text amendment to the Unified Development Code to allow drive-up automatic bank teller as permitted use in the C3 General Commercial Zoning District as a conditional use in the C4 Downtown Commercial Zoning District and to establish signage regulations for a drive-up automatic bank teller use and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. <coughs> we have any public input? Yes. Hello, uh, Emily Sewell, uh, I guess I'll go 900 Jackson Street. Uh, I'm here uh, on behalf of Capra Bank uh, as Gronin, just to, uh, to be here for any questions and just tell you that we're very excited about this uh, amendment. This is, as Wally said, a technological advancement in ATMs and uh, ABTs. And so, you know, just adapting our unified development code to help all financial institutions better serve their clients. And we feel that this would be a really good, uh, you know, conditional use and, and new use for, for these spaces. So happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Emily, for your comments. Seeing no one else here, do we have any virtual input? No. Okay. City Clerk's Office. No? All right, back to the table for any discussion. Mr. Mr. Resnick, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you, if you wouldn't mind, so Capper Bank 
Uh, this is a full-service institution in, in in Dubuque, and is in the location. I was looking for the location here. Is it in the former um, grocery store that was a uh, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're in 900 Jackson with with us in the uh, on the uh, southeast corner. <clears throat> right. So I mean, but you have a full-service institution here, and this would just be. Uh, uh, because I didn't know if we're, you know, any kind of, uh, we may be available to lots of different banks just putting up uh, a drive through. Mm -hmm. But to me, I think it's great that we have, you know, full service operation here that right. if people have some issues with, with their, um, with the ATM that they can go and visit. And, of course. And you're there. All yeah. right. Thank yes. you very much. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Varma, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good ordinance change, and I also um, just really appreciate the um, opportunity to upgrade the technology for all of us here in the uh, the city to just drive up and, and use the um, machinery. Thank you. Um, Mr. Resnick brought a, a, a point I hadn't, I, actually, I don't know why I hadn't thought about it, but I mean, like, Wells Fargo doesn't have a branch here, um, but they could now have an ATM sitting there. And do we see any challenges with that? Do we see any concerns with, I mean, I, I, think, I think we're all well aware that there is still physical banking, but a lot of it is moving away from this in general. So this is probably a moot point, but I just thought I'd ask about it because I'm just curious. Yes, there's no, there's no requirement that you have to be a local, um, okay. like, uh, I don't know how you want to describe it, actually have a physical building located in the corporate sure. limits. So yes, like a Wells Fargo could open, could have an automated bank teller machine located here or any other credit union or banking yeah. institution that's not located in Dubuque. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Just interesting point. Just thought I'd ask it. Okay. Fair enough. Seeing no other discussion or questions, the motion here is to receive and file. Waive the three readings. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number nine is Community Development Block Grant Fiscal Year 24 Annual Action Plan Amendment number one. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Oh. Ms. Wethel. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. We got a motion by Wethel, second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council adopt the resolution approving amendment number one to the fiscal year 2024 community development block grant annual action plan as reviewed by the community development advisory commission at their meetings on august 16 2023 and september 6 2023 the fiscal year 2024 annual action plan is being amended to reflect the funding amounts of activities with carryover from previous year's allocations and reallocated funds Several activities have carryover funds that we reallocated to activities which can meet our timeliness requirements per HUD. These carryover and reallocated funds will allow these projects to be completed fiscal year 24. Activities ap approved in fiscal year 23 with carryover funds include the Merida Tyson Child Care Center Rehab for $50,000, Food Access Hydroponics for $25,541, Activities approved in fiscal year 23 that will receive reallocated funds to complete these activities in fiscal year 24 include the ANI project at 90 Main for $750,000, Ecumenical Towers Elevator Replacement for $380,000, Homeless Shelter Rehab for $41,339, Avon Park for $99,995. Activities improved in fiscal year 24 with carryover funds from the fiscal year 23 include Lead and Healthy Homes for $171,901, Lincoln Outdoor Wellness for $474,432. Activities approved through the Community Development Advisory Commission and included in the fiscal year 24 annual action plan amendment number one using reallocated funds include 
Mount Pleasant Homes men's ADA bathroom for $18,000 and Four Mounds Build Dubuque for $85,000. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider an amendment number one to the fiscal year 24 community development block grant annual action plan as reviewed by the Community Development Advisory Commission at their meetings on August 16th, 23 and September 6, 23. Do we have any public input on this item? Seeing no one here, anyone virtually? No. no. Nobody decided to stick around and party with us like I suggested <laughs> earlier. Do we have any discussion? Any questions? Yes, Mr. Mr. Resnick. Mayor, thank you. I was hoping that Ms. Steger could talk to me about the ANI at 90 Main, $750,000. I remember being at the uh, one of the openings that they had, and they had a lot going on. What are their plans for this? So the current phase is putting mini splits in. So the um, the entire air development doesn't have any air conditioning, so they've been using window air conditioners where they can. Um, this does affect our historic look of the building, so is not uh, ideal. It also drips onto the street, just like you're in New York. So um, we're, they're looking at completely putting that all interior and doing main splits in every single uh, unit um, and replacing some of the um, other small things that are pertaining to the HVAC system. So. Uh, that is this current phase of their construction. Do they have steam heat or uh, uh, hot water heat or some other kind of pipes so they don't have the uh, right. forced air? Yeah, they have boilers and then they have electric baseboard heaters in um, bedrooms because those are interior and didn't have the uh, piping in the exterior. So there's nothing in the walls at all for space. So they're having to reconfigure some of the uh, construction just to get space to put those interior. Wow, well, that, that's exciting. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alexis. All right, the well, motion here is to receive and file and adopt this resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. <clears throat> Public hearing number 10 is Dubuque Racing Association, Association Lease Improvement Project, Lot 1 of Chaplain Schmidt Island, requesting consent of city to improvements, leasehold, mortgage, and subordination agreement. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to... I'm gonna let a motion happen first and then I'll come back to you, Ms. Farber. Does that sound good? So, Mr. Jones. Mr. Mayor, I move that we receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Jones, a second by Wethel. Go ahead, Ms. Farber. Yes, I need to recuse myself due to my relationship with Midwest One. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll let Ms. Farber leave the room and then we will move on to Mike, please. Or actually, Krenna, please, sorry. I had that all pulled up and I was ready to go and I still did it wrong. <laughs> I almost forgot to, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> Uh, the City of Dubuque, in conjunction with the Dubuque Racing Association and community participants, have worked diligently for years to procure a Chaplain Schmidt Island Master Plan and Schmidt Island Placemaking and Implementation Plan. Work on implementation of the plans has been ongoing. The biggest project to date has been the Veterans Memorial. A community project funding grant was received via Representative Hinson for construction of the Veterans Memorial Trailhead Project and will be constructed in 2024. In 2022, the city invested millions of dollars in improvements to I'm On Arena. Additional improvements to the arena are currently in process. The Chaplain Schmidt Island Master Plan, as adopted in 2014 and amended in 2017, um, the Chaplain Schmidt Island Placemaking and implement Implementation Plan was adopted in 2017. The goals of the plans were largely recreational focused and included connecting and expanding access to the riverfront, creation of educational opportunities on the island, highlighting the unique characteristics of the island, bringing new visitors to the island, and offering activities and events for all seasons. The largest tenant on the island is the Dubuque Racing Association leasing and operating Q Casino. The Dubuque Racing Association has proposed approximately $90 million in public and private improvements to the island. The improvements completed or proposed include public improvements, Iowa Improvement, uh, Iowa Amphitheater on Chaplain Schmidt Island, 
Veterans Memorial Trailhead Project, proposed $40 million Chaplin Schmidt Island connectivity and access improvements, including a railroad overpass at 14th Street. The private improvements include construction of a new eight-story, 108-room Hilton Tapestry Collection Hotel adjacent to the existing Hilton Garden Inn, including an upscale rooftop restaurant, lounge, and event space overlooking the Mississippi River, an interior casino remodel, including elevated bar with bar top slot machines and updated showroom, a new sports book and a new sports bar, new banquet space and party rooms, the addition of a family entertainment zone for all ages with high-end arcade games, and exterior casino upgrades, including the facade, signage, landscaping, and surface parking. The private improvements to the island necessitate consent to the improvements by the city, which is required by the lease for any improvements over $100,000, and the financing of the improvements by the Dubuque Racing Association, um, where the lender for the Dubuque Racing Association, Midwest One Bank, requires the city consent to a leasehold mortgage and city agreement to subordination of its lease in favor of Midwest One Bank. Um, this also involves updates to the lease between the city and the Dubuque Racing Association. An amended lease has been negotiated between the city and the Dubuque Racing Association for Lot 1 of Chaplin Schmidt Island, which contains the area where the casino, existing hotel and restaurant, and the new hotel um, are located. The lease consolidates separate leases for the casino and the hotel restaurant into a single lease. It adds a consumer price index escalator on the lease payment related to the hotel and restaurant portion. It establishes a debt payment reserve fund of $7 million over five years. It clarifies responsibility for environmental issues. It allows usage of $3 million in funds, which are currently in the cash reserve fund by the Dubuque Racing Association for down payment on the construction improvements. And it allows continued approval for carryover of $2.5 million from fiscal year 2022 that had been budgeted for debt payments by the Dubuque Racing Association to be used towards the down payment on the construction loan for the improvements. The leasehold mortgage and subordination agreement have been reviewed and negotiated between the parties. My office consulted with outside counsel as well on review of those documents. Public hearing on the lease and the consent to and approval of the improvements, leasehold mortgage and subordination agreement are what are before you this evening and staff respectfully requests or recommends approval. Thank you very much, Karna. We are in a public hearing to consider a Dubuque Racing Association DRA lease improvement projects, lot one of Chaplin Schmidt Island, requesting the consent of the city to improvements, leasehold mortgage and subordination agreement, and the city attorney, as she mentioned, is recommending approval. Do we have any public input on this this evening? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council. Uh, Alex Dixon. I um, humbly serve as the President and CEO of Q Casino and DRA. Uh, we are great partners uh, with the City of Dubuque uh, and really just want to uh, to thank uh, uh, staff, City Manager Mike Van Milling and, and Krenna, uh, as well as the entire team. Um, uh, this is a, m a momentous day. Uh, it is past my bedtime, um, so I will um, uh, make my comments brief, but I really want to be able to uh, say thank you. I really appreciate the partnership. This means a lot to our community, um, and I think it's uh, really important to know these debt agreements. 100% uh, of the funding to help uh, to build this facility uh, is coming from our community, and I think uh, it uh, should be noted that nearly 80% of the funds of the hard construction dollars are going to Dubuque area um, uh, contractors, and 99% are going to those based in Iowa. Um, and so this money is being raised from our community, being deployed to make it better, help to drive more revenues so that we can send more um, as a nonprofit casino to you. Uh, and then those dollars are going back into our community in the form of, um, of, of contracts to, to, local, uh, to local contractors here. So thank you all very much. Uh, and I appreciate the hard work that you all do on long nights like tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your comments. Seeing no one else, anyone virtually? No. All right. No. 
Nothing from the city clerk's office. All right. Well, I'm going to kick us off here as we as we talk about this because um, of all the of all the things you'd you'd rather have a full room for. This one is one of those. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those uh, moments where we're getting some really important work done here, but a lot of this work has been done already um, in in talking about this agreement, formulating this agreement in a way that's best for for all the parties involved. Um, and it was hard work, and and I'm glad that we did it. But this is a big deal. This is a momentous night, actually, and to make sure that we're we're moving forward with these projects that we've been talking talking about and drumming up interest for. It's very exciting to finally be at this moment where we can do this because it is, uh, it's a, a good good move forward for the city and I'm really looking forward to voting for this. So with that, I'll open Mr. it up Mayor. for any other discussion. Mr. Jones. I, this was a, this is a big deal. And a lot of thanks are involved. We have to thank Alex for his patience because it took us a while to struggle and get to a place where we were comfortable and understand what was being asked of us. But everybody had to reach. Man, the DRA reached and reached and reached and grab the star, and you know I, th I think you got something happening here. Uh, Midwest One really reached beyond their norm to make this happen. They, they, they're taking some chances and reaching a little bit farther and showing some trust in the institution of the DRA and in the city of Dubuque. And uh, I've been on the DRA board since I came on the council, and that was a long time ago, 2006, I was seated. Um, I'm really proud of the work that's done there. I'm really proud of the work that's done here and the synergy of the DRA and the city of Dubuque absolutely makes great things happen. And this is, tonight we're just kind of lighting the fuse formally to, to really make some, some big, big things start to happen. So congratulations to everybody. Alex, thank you for your patience with us. As again, we, we had a lot of late nights like this to get here. And uh, I'm glad we got here. Yeah, Mr. Spring, thank you. Um, yeah. Echoing a lot of what Mr. Jones says, I view this as the start of a lot of things that are going to be phenomenal down at Chaplain Schmidt Island, where in five years, no one will recognize it, what it was. And so I'm very excited that we're moving, hopefully going to be moving forward on this. So thank you. Mr. Resnick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, it sounds like a great project, and I think it's going to be... Um, uh, the right thing for us to do. I, I was just a little confused by, um, at the beginning, we have the city attorney recommending it. And I haven't heard, you know, then at the back, it says, well, staff respectfully recommends their approval. I guess for me, if the city uh, attorney recommends it, it says we can do this. And if the city manager recommends it, to me, it is we should do this. <laughs> okay. And so... I, I'm just wondering if you could weigh in uh, personally, Mr. Oh, Van absolutely. Milligan. Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, the way it was structured like that is because really once the deal was done, it turned into a lot of legal documents, and Kren has been working on this tirelessly for months, and so that's where the recommendation came from. Um, but I appreciate this opportunity because... I believe that the next three to four years are going to be the biggest economic development years in the in Dubuque since post-World War II when John Deere showed up. And I think there's a plenty long list of projects that you'll be able to talk about and be excited about, but this particular project is transformational. And I have described Alex Dixon to people in our community as our Tim Cook are Jeff Bezos, and I really believe that. Um, Alex is providing tremendous leadership at the DRA. This project and the associated city projects like the 14th Street overpass and the 16th Street corridor and Elm Street corridor improvements is not only gonna improve Schmidt Island and make us such a greater attraction as a community to the outside world, but it's gonna create tremendous opportunities for people that live in Dubuque today, for jobs, for entertainment, for the list goes on. So um, I enthusiastically recommend uh, approval of this and in support of City Attorney Krenna Brumwell and all the hard work she's put into it, and Alex Dixon and the DRA Board of Directors who have been steadfast in making this project happen. So thank you. And thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Wethel. 
I'm going to use an Alex Dixon phrase, which is, we deserve nice things. <laughs> and Alex has said that about other projects in our city that we look forward to. But in this case, I see this as a way that our people can be with the river, near the river, enjoy what we have as one of our greatest assets, and within that space also um, bring those resources back into our city. So thank you for your hard work. Um, thank you to staff for all of the hard work that's gone into this. Thank you to my council colleagues, because um, I've learned a lot through this process, and I've appreciated um, everyone's kind of feedback. And I think we've really dug deep on this one to make sure that it's the right thing for the people of Dubuque. Thank you. Mr. May, one yeah. last comment. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mike's characterizations of uh, Alex are correct, but I have to add one. So I've been telling people that a half-hour meeting with Alex is equal to a week at Disneyland with a regular person. <laughs> <laughs> is, that a, is that a good thing? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so Ms. Russell, I think you still had yeah. something to say here. <laughs> I fully um, support what everything has, everyone has said at this table, and I'm just excited to be at this table as this comes to, um, as this comes to fruition and, we, and gets started. I, I'm proud to be able to say, yeah, I was there. I was there when that started. I, I'm so excited to look forward and see what's going to happen in the next few years. We'll all enjoy it, I know. Thank you. Yeah, this is some some hard work that's been done, and um, this is really you know all that all that work is leading to this point here where we're able to finally put this all in motion and, and move it right ahead, which I think is uh, the it's a great time to be here. It really is. We we heard from Travel Dubuque to kick this night off. We've had some great difficult discussions, but some really good ones, and we get to talk about some fun stuff. And I see Aaron back here. We still get to talk about five flags in a little bit here. Hopefully <laughs> before too long. So with all that said. Um, we have a motion here to receive and file and adopt this resolution. So Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. And with that, I'll invite Ms. Farber back into the room if she can hear me. Congratulations. And we can move on to number 11, please, Trish. Public hearing number 11 is Lease Agreement Amphitheater Lot 2 and 3. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. Receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. Um, it's me. Karana, please. I'm not going to reread you the prior memo. Much of it is the same with the addition of the fact that the plans adopted for the island included the recreational focus and in the concept of an amphitheater on the island. So when funding through Destination Iowa became available, the city applied for funding toward construction of the Iowa Amphitheater on Schmidt Island. The city was successful in its application, receiving $3 million towards construction of an amphitheater from the state of Iowa. The Iowa Amphitheater on Schmidt Island, uh, the project will be a significant investment in an outdoor amphitheater. It will be the centerpiece of an ongoing effort coordinated by the Dubuque Racing Association to create a recreational landmark and gateway into Iowa, with the goal being to enhance outdoor recreational amenities and activities on the island and increase tourism in Dubuque and the tri-state region. Uh, the Dubuque Racing Association will contribute to the project financially, paying the city's debt payment related to construction of the amphitheater, and it desires to lease the amphitheater property from the city. A uh, lease has been negotiated between the city and the DRA for lots two and three of Chaplin Schmidt Island, which contains the area where the amphitheater will be constructed. This would be the public hearing, and staff is recommending approval. Thank you very much, Krenna. We are in a public hearing to consider the uh, lease with the Dubuque Racing Association, the DRA, uh, for the amphitheater lease in lot two and three of Chaplin Schmidt Island. Staff is recommending approval. Do we have any public input on this item? Again, uh, Alex Dixon, uh, humbly service president, CEO at Q Casino and DRA. Again, wanted to thank the entire city council um, uh, as well as. Uh, my partner, I'll just say my partner, um, Marie Ware uh, in the Leisure Services um, uh, Division, uh, the director in the Leisure Services Division. Congratulations, by the way. Um, this could not happen without the city of Dubuque. Um, 
we literally uh, applied for these funds um, um, uh, from the state of Iowa through Destination Iowa, but we had a gap. Uh, and this body um, uh, took, um, is taking uh, some <coughs> risk, um, but uh, we are going to be fu fully funding these bonds, but we could not do this without you. And so I, I want to make sure that, um, that that doesn't get lost uh, in this sentiment. There's a lot of things going on, but the city of Dubuque has made an investment in, uh, in leisure as well as, um, uh, as well as the island. And so we're going to fully pay that back, but in a rising interest rate environment, um, something like an outdoor amphitheater um, uh, could host events like many of you probably went to the Oktoberfest that was hosted in our back parking lot um, uh, just this past weekend. Uh, in the future, um, events like that, when we're not hosting a 7,000 person concert like Jelly Roll, um, we could uh, enjoy those. And so uh, I again want to just, just share my gratitude uh, for uh, the investment uh, within, within uh, the DRA, uh, but really within ourselves. And so again, very grateful for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your comments. Any others? Not seeing anybody virtually, nothing there. No. City Clerk's Office, great. Back to the table for discussion. Mr. Mayor, I know that yeah, you shared Barbara. some accolades before, and I just sure. wanted to give both um, uh, the president here and uh, our director of leisure services a shout out for all the work that you have done, uh, Alex, uh, to get this accomplished. And I very much look forward to the uh, new facility uh, and its operations. And um, thank you for all your guidance and leadership on getting this done. Thank you, Ms. Farber. All right. Motion here is to receive and file, adopt this resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number 12 is issuance of not to exceed $1 million sewer revenue capital loan note. Interim financing, state revolving funds, planning and design loan application. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Wethel. I ask to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Motion by Wethel, second by Resnick. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Larson is recommending City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $1 million in sewer revenue capital loan notes state revolving loan fund program. One million dollars of the proceeds will be used to fund the planning and design of the improvements to various elements of the existing Cedar Street lift station, Terminal Street lift station, and the associated force mains between the two and to the city's public wastewater treatment facility. The state revolving capital loan notes will carry a zero interest rate for up to three years and have no initiation or servicing fees. The loan may be rolled into an SRF construction loan or repaid when permanent financing is obtained. The proceedings have been prepared to show as a first step the receipt of any oral or written objections from any resident or property owner to the proposed action of the council <laughs> to authorize the form of loan and dispersed agreement and issue the notes to the Iowa Finance Authority. A summary of objections received or made, if any, should be attached to the proceedings. After all objections have been received and considered, if the City Council decides to enter into the agreement and issue the notes, a form of resolution follows that should be introduced and adopted entitled, Resolution Taking Additional Action with Respect to a Sewer Revenue Loan and Disbursement Agreement and Authorizing, Approving, and Securing the Payment of $1 million Sewer Revenue Loan and Disbursement Agreement Anticipation Project Note the Iowa Finance Authority Interim and Disbursement Agreement. The event the City Council decides to abandon the proposal, then the form of resolution included in said proceedings should not be adopted. In this event, a motion merely be adopted to the effect that such proposal is abandoned. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider the issuance of not to exceed $1 million in sewer revenue capital loan notes. Um, interim financing state revolving funds, planning and design loan applications. Do we have anyone here to address us on this item? I see no one. Anyone virtually? No one there? Yep. And from city clerk's office. Any discussion or questions? 
Seeing none, hearing none. Motion here is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Our last public hearing for the night is um, issuance of not to exceed 430,000 sewer revenue capital loan notes, interim financing, state revolving funds, planning and design loan applications. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Farber? I motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. Motion by Farber, second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Larson is recommending City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $430,000 in sewer revenue capital loan notes, interim financing, state revolving loan fund program. $430,000 of proceeds will be used to fund the planning and design of the improvements on Laurel Street, on Grove Terrace, on other streets as determined necessary and the inspection and condition assessment of other aging sewer infrastructure. The state revolving capital loan notes will carry a 0% interest rate for up to three years and have no initiation or servicing fees. The loan may be rolled into an SRF construction loan or repaid when permanent financing is obtained. The proceedings have been prepared to show as a first step the receipt of any oral or written objections from any resident or property owner to the proposed action of the City Council to authorize the form of loan and disbursement agreement and issue the notes to the Iowa Finance Authority. A summary of objections received or made, if any, should be attached to the proceedings. After all objections have been received and considered, if the City Council decides to enter into the agreement and issue the notes, a form of resolution follows that should be introduced and adopted, entitled, Resolution Taking Additional Action with Respect to a Sewer Revenue Loan and disbursement agreement and authorizing, approving, and securing the payment of a $430,000 sewer revenue loan and disbursement agreement anticipation project note, Iowa Finance Authority interim and disbursement agreement. In the event the City Council decides to abandon the proposal, then the form of resolution included in said proceeding should not be adopted. In this event, a motion merely be adopted to the effect that such proposal is abandoned. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider the issuance of not to exceed $430,000 in sewer revenue capital loan notes, interim financing for state revolving funds, planning and design and loan applications. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one out there, do we have anyone virtually? No? And nothing from the city clerk's office? Back to the table. Any discussion, questions? Seeing none and hearing none. The motion on the table is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Uh, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next on the agenda is public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and clearly state your name and address for the record when the Mayor asks if there is any in-person -per input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address. Phone participants, Please state your name and address when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the city council cannot take formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to an action item on tonight's agenda. Thank you, Trish. Any public input? Any more public input this evening? <laughs> no? No more virtually, I see. Nothing else from the city clerk's office, okay? Not seeing any other further public input, we can move on to action items. Okay, moving on to action item number one, USDA, Forest Service Urban and Community Forest Program Grant Award. 
Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and approve. Second. Motion by Roussel, second by Resnick. Um, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware is notifying the City Council that the City of Dubuque has been awarded a USDA Forest Service Urban and Community Forest Program grant totaling $1,499,978. The U.S. Department of Agricultural Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry Program is offering grants of up to $50 million to support the planning and imp implementation of nature-based solutions to ensure a resilient and equitable tree canopy, canopy. Established through the Inflation Reduction Act, this is the only dedicated federal urban forest program that will provide direct funding to address the economic, social, and environmental challenges that underserved and economically distressed communities are experiencing due, a, due to a low urban tree canopy. The award helps the City of Dubuque meet goals outlined in the Comprehensive Plan and the 50% by 2030 Community, 2030 Community Climate Action and Resiliency Plan, as well as the City Council goal, Sustainable Environment, Preserving and Enhancing Natural Resources. Dubuque seeks to increase its tree canopy cover to grow from 26.2% to 40%. To support that goal, the USDA Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry Resources will help the city plant 6,600 trees on public and private property in disadvantaged census tracts 1, 3, 5, and 12.02 over the five-year project period. The number of trees proposed was identified in Dubuque's Climate Action Plan to realize its tree canopy goal in the targeted neighborhood. There are several key activities of the Branching Out Dubuque Initiative, and the success of this grant is a credit to all departments involved in the formulation, data, research of writing the grant. Those departments include Leisure Services, Sustainability, City Manager's Office, the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support. An extremely important partner in this process was Dubuque Trees Forever, and several members of their organization, and I would credit their president, Council Member Laura Rousseau, in that group. Special credit is deserved for the leadership and work provided by the Director of Sustainability, Gina Bell, Director of Strategic Partnerships, Terry Goodman, Park Division Manager, Steve Faisal, in this grant that now will allow us to do very important reforestation efforts in under-resourced areas of our community. A grant agreement will be forwarded for approval once it is received. And at this time, this memo is for informational purposes only. Thank you very much, Mike. Ms. Roussel, do you have any comments? I do. I do. Um, 6,600 trees will change the face of our community. These trees will bring environmental, health, social and economic benefits for all, but especially those in our low-income neighborhoods. Cities across the country applied, but because of our great staff and the wonderful community partners, we were able to access this unprecedented funding. So I just warn all the potential volunteers out there in the community that we will be needing your help to make this happen, but. I just, this is a, a green legacy that we can all be very, very proud of. Thank you. I feel like that warning is directly for us. <laughs> <laughs> I see my future and it is, it is a hot and sweaty digging type of future. That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Roussel. I have, a, I have a quick process question before Mr. Resnick, I'll come right to you. But um, I, you know, you mentioned this is for um, just to, for informational purposes only. The suggested disposition was to actually approve something. Is there anything to approve here? Uh, not yet, not until we have the grant agreement. Is that, that's correct, right, Marie? I just wanted to clarify that before we, before we move any further. Marie Ware, Leisure Services Manager, or sorry, Director. Um, <laughs> I said that too many times. Um, so tonight it was just to let you know we did get it, yep. um, and the information related to it. 
um, we await the grant agreement to come. So um, Terry has actually reached out already, Terry Goodman, um, reached out already to USDA about, hey, when are we gonna expect this? Because I'm like, we need that in order to really get going and know the rules of the game, because mm -hmm. that's what grant agreements have. So it will come back to you once we have that grant yeah. agreement so we can formally accept and then we are off to the races. So we have nothing to approve this evening? No. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that when we're done having we'll conversations. I don't appreciate it. Receive and file and appreciate, sure, that can work, right. that can really work. All right, we'll come back to that in a moment. Mr. Reznik, go ahead. Thank oh, thank you. you. And uh, I was, uh, you know, this is a night we think of past councils and uh, uh, with with appreciation. I just wanted to, of course, thank uh, Ms. Roussel, who's doing wonderful work and, and gathering people together. She's a natural for people want to work with her. But I, I'm remembering tonight uh, the former mayor, Roy Buell, who paid for and planted a good-sized tree down at Burden Park as part of a program. And uh, he, you know, the emerald ash borer uh, destruction, just he just took it personally. He just uh, loves, uh, you know, growing things and loves trees uh, maybe as much as Mr. Roussel. But so I'm thinking about him tonight and, uh, well, you know, his influence uh, on our community. And I'm, I'm glad he's thrilled. So am I. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. All right, so now we'll deal with the business. Ms. Roussel, would you care to amend your motion? Yes, I would move to receive and file. Okay, and then we had a second by Resnick, so are you okay with that, Mr. Resnick? Second. All right, so we have that motion, and second in. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Weppel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is Five Flags Civic Center Fiscal Year 23 Annual Report Presentation. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that we commend Aaron for being awake and yes. receive and file and hear the presentation. Second place. Please. Entertainment, I'm used to the nightlife. So <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yes. We got a motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Aaron, thank you so much for sticking with us. We're looking forward to the presentation. No worries. Obviously, I'm glad to be here. Uh, first off, great news to, to convey tonight. So that's good news to be here this late and have great news to, to relay to you guys. Uh, uh, very excited as the year, as we mentioned, for kicking things off. Um, very first things in our building. A lot of things we've been doing um, is just updating, facelifting the building. Um, and my big drive is customer experience. So trying to get those things done that customers see, touch points, um, other things to make things uh, better for our staff. A couple of pictures, we put some new flooring in one of our concession stands, as you can see, need replacing, painting. Outside, we did some uh, shrubbery, uh, some mulch, clean up the trees, as you can see there on the bottom left, um, some new signage that we put up. Um, you're gonna hear me talk about a couple different times um, about fighting low staff issues, which everybody's doing nowadays. Uh, one of the things that came up with is a kind of revamping our whole signage in the building to give better directions to our customers. So if we don't have us ushers there, maybe staff members in there to help customers, uh, the signage will help. I also put new ones on the floor as well, so when you walk into the arena, I also labeled the stairs going up to the uh, seats as well, so you know which row you're in. Some basic stuff, but uh, pretty good stuff there. Also on there is a new HVAC unit that we put in our north dressing rooms that didn't have it before, so uh, great for, grateful for that. A couple other creature comforts there. On the left there is our new fuse chargers. What they are is basically any other arena you can go to in the United States. Um, it's basically a charging pack for your phone. You sit there in a concert, you got 5% for two bucks for a half hour. Get this little charger pack, pop it out, plug your phone in. When you're done, put it back before you leave. If you want to take it home, it's 40 bucks. Otherwise, you're going to Quad Cities tomorrow night to another concert. You can actually return it at that machine. So trying to stay on the front of things and keep customers happy. Um, you know, when you don't have enough outlets, that's big. We've all been there with uh, events for our phone. Uh, new key access for our staff. And finally, there on the right is our new um, bike rack covers, which make them look nicer and not just have a bike rack sitting in different places. Um, we do borrow these out a lot to the community, so just one thing there. Real quick overview, as you can see our events from in uh, t fiscal year 23. Uh, started with Almost Famous and ended uh, with ZZ Top. And as you can see, everything is in between there um, of all of our events throughout the year. 
event analysis for this year, uh, 66 events this year, uh, total attendance of 64,597, so both up from last year. Gross ticket sales was down just a little bit, and gross food and beverage was down just a little bit, but I'll get to those in just a little bit. Um, but overall, still a great year um, financially. Uh, and then the big numbers here um, that come in at the end, of course, we came in $176,148 under the benchmark. So what that means is it saves taxpayers money. It goes back to them. So, you know, different things throughout the building, mitigating cost, getting payroll down, uh, other things like HVAC contracts, trying to keep those things uh, lower so we can um, save the taxpayers money. So as you can tell, two great numbers there at the bottom there, uh, also 112 thousand under our actual budget as well. So numbers wise, as you can tell, great year, hopefully continues. One of our biggest things is our food and beverage. Um, when I took over in late October, uh, November, one of the first things I changed with our food and beverage is I went out and got uh, six double wide uh, coolers. Um, we didn't have the money, but I knew they would pay themselves off immediately, which they did. Um, and basically we have our new grab and go concept. If you've been to any cities outside of Dubuque, you've probably seen this already. If you've been to a gas station, you've experienced this. Self-explanatory, six coolers full of beer and pop sitting there, maybe some popcorn, um, a pretzel. You grab it yourself, you go to the end, and you pay for it with your credit card. Again, another thing I've added, again, trying to do that customer experience, make that better, make that faster. You don't have enough staff to open enough windows in a concession area. This is a great way to combat that as well. Uh, another thing we've implemented is hawkers. We brought those back. Um, I brought those back, and uh, it was the first time they've been in the building since hockey was there, which 20 plus years ago. So the hawkers that you see at you know, baseball games going up and down the aisle selling. Again, another example of we can't have enough staff to make the lines short enough. How can we make the lines short enough? Bring the beer to the people. Increases your revenue. Pretty, pretty, pretty uh, simple stuff there. Um, just mentioned our grab and go there. Um, another thing that makes us tick is our volunteers. Um, we could not be open without our volunteer groups because we just physically can't get enough staff. Um, with that being said, you can see over almost $29,000 uh, this past year in donations to the groups. Uh, Dubuque Ice Skaters, Dubuque Senior, Lowers College, Toys for Tots are, is our, definitely our biggest. They always send the most volunteers, so Naturally, they have raised the most amount of money. Take a buyer demographics. Not a ton changed from years past. Uh, a couple new cities on there from people purchasing cities. Pretty email, uh, pretty close to being even female to male. Um, and as you noticed, 67% uh, of the ticket purchases came from outside of Dubuque County. So um, when we talk about bringing other things to town, filling up the hotels down there, filling up. Uh, the restaurants on Main Street, we love being a part of that. And with tickets showing outside of Dubuque County, I'm sure we're helping with those numbers. Um, highest attended uh, event for the year, of course, our community event. I do implore you to come down uh, December 17th, if you have time, to the Five Flag Center. It's the annual Toys for Tots event. If you haven't seen this event, or been a part of it, I would suggest you come down, maybe help out, maybe volunteer. If not, just watch. Uh, it's music in motion, getting that many people through in a short amount of time. Um, as you know, this event, they get free toys, they get free food, they get to see a fire truck, an ambulance. So it's one of our great and uh, biggest, obviously, community events. Highest concert for the year, um, 3,444 people at Cody Jenks. Um, the research I found, this is the highest back to 2007 minimally. So the highest attended event, single event. Um, that was booked uh, last minute, probably two months out, so it was a very nice show to add to our year. Um, and the food and beverage numbers were great there. Highest multi-day event is, of course, our battle for the Bluff Rodeo, and that will be returning once again um, in February. A couple quick shots, right there in the middle, Kenny Wayne Shepherd breaking Benjamin in the top right. I always refer to that show because that was a show we shouldn't have gotten. Again, I always say that referring to that meaning that's a show that we normally went to Cedar Rapids. Or quad, or quad Cities, bigger arena, uh, pulled some strings, did some free advertising, and we got the show, so that was good there. Comic Con, just other events there. <clears throat> Headlines, as you can see, some of the, the ones there, you guys were at the arena for the tour, uh, and me, of course, uh, becoming permanent GM, which I'm very glad and thankful for. 
Uh, social media, as we go, of course, the big thing here, a lot of people talking about how do you advertise, how do you get your shows out. This is a lot of it right here is our social media with our Facebook and Instagram followers. Venue partners, as always, uh, this is a great list to have because it helps us not only with sponsorship, but uh, other ways across the building, Midwest One, Quick Stop. A lot of the same names you're gonna see on there because they're great partners and we love uh, adding them. And this year with my new staff, which I'll get to in just a little bit, definitely looking to expand this list as well. Um, real quick, uh, here's our staff. Um, a lot of you don't know me. Uh, Marie suggested to take this minute to just kind of uh, introduce myself real quick and where I've come from. Um, I came from Dubuque uh, my whole life. I lived in Chicago for a couple years, but we don't count that. So uh, born and raised in Dubuque, graduated Hempstead High School, graduated from NICC. Um, and then uh, proceeded in the entertainment industry. I started uh, in the entertainment industry when I was about 14. I started DJing weddings and at bars. I was in most bars before I could ever drink. Uh, turned into homecomings and proms and whatever. Uh, transitioned into our radio career. I, I am still to this day on the radio in a fill-in basis on vacation on Town Square Media. Uh, so uh, radio is a, a love and it's not a money job, that's for sure. So. Uh, continue to do that, uh, but and that transitioned into me into the Mississippi Moon Bar, which up until pre-COVID uh, was the entertainment operations manager there. Got the opportunity during COVID to come over here to Five Flags, and I don't regret that decision whatsoever. I'm glad I'm here. So, one thing I am really excited to share with you guys, and trying to make this as fast as possible, is my full staff and uh, not since pre-COVID has Five Flags been fully staffed management-wise, and here we are today, and I, uh, I'm glad to tell you that we are. So, kind of the family tree there, my right and left hand, my two directors, uh, Greg Olson, he's my director of finance. Uh, just came to us from a private firm here in town. Uh, loves the entertainment industry, is looking for a change, and he's found it because it's not your typical nine to five uh, accounting physician. Uh, J.R. Cook, our Director of Operations, his pedigree speaks for itself. Uh, we got J.R. from the State Farm Stadium. He actually had to work the Super Bowl before I could hire him, so he worked the Super Bowl, packed up his house and his wife, uh, and moved across the country uh, to be with us. Two direct reports and brand new employees to us as well. Uh, our new marketing manager, Miles Smith, he comes for us from the casino world recently got married and uh, also moved back to Dubuque to take a job with us. So very happy to have him. Matt Oberhofer, he's our new food and beverage manager. Um, this position has been a rotating carousel of people for many, many years. I truly believe we found the right guy this time. <clears throat> he comes to us from the casino world and he gets entertainment. So the uni uniqueness of food and beverages of Five Flags is you can't, you gotta be that person that's not working a nine to five. You know, we work crazy hours, we work 16 hour days sometimes. And so you have to have that ebb and flow. Matt gets it, he's excited. He's coming in with some great ideas already and uh, looking for the future with him. And I think our food and member, uh, beverage numbers are gonna continue to rise under his watch. Uh, rounding out the management team, um, J.R. Cook, as I mentioned, he's my director of operations. Under him, we have our uh, uh, operations supervisor, Rick Brember. He's the guy that takes care of all of our uh, setup needs, um, for, or excuse me, setup needs and uh, cleanup needs for the shows. Been with us 20 plus years. Love Rick, he's one of our anchors. Zach Giese, he took over for the retired Dan Holdcamp. Um, I'll get to that in just a second, but Zach, of course, takes care of all our technical needs. Uh, sound and lights for most shows. Nick Fairfan, a great guy, uh, comes to us from Chicago, Loris intern, worked his way up, was an intern for us, went to be full time, filled in for food and beverage for us a few, uh, little bit, and now he's settled in as our brand new uh, uh, events manager and he's taken that role and uh, run with it. So we're very excited to have Nick on the team. Um, finally there on that side is Steve Ringgold. He's our brand new maintenance manager. We hired him from, um, down near the Quad Cities, he, he managed multiple buildings before, so we feel Five Flags is gonna be a great fit for him. He has a great on-hands experience. Wrapping up our team is our, our rock, in the bottom left corner is Allison. Uh, she is definitely our rock in the building. She's been there 20 plus years, box office manager and payroll, so. Um, lots of youth um, and, and inexperience, but on the same token, just enough experience in there 
And uh, the inexperience does come with, you know, vigor and uh, excitement for the job and uh, ready with new ideas. So we're excited about that. As I mentioned real quickly, two massive retirements for us this year. Um, Dan Holdkamp, our technical and production manager, he was with us for nearly 40 years. And Bob Richardson, our maintenance manager. So Bob was the guy that knew every nut bolt in the building, took care of everything. Uh, so they both retired from full-time action for us uh, earlier this year. Luckily, uh, we are lucky enough to keep them both on part-time, and uh, you know they both pass their knowledge on uh, to the people that are uh, taking over now. So we're very excited uh, to have them on part-time. Our two anchor tenants, which have always been here, Dubuque Symphony Orchestra and Fly By Night, of course, return for another season. Um, and then wrapping up here real quickly, our upcoming events that we have, uh, the Foolers, uh, Penn and Teller uh, sh uh, show from there, from America's Got Talent. Uh, uh, Taylor Swift tribute, Run Collective, which is a Christian show. Uh, I Illuminate, The Tappening, Henry Rollins. So we have a great variety of, of events coming up. We have a great uh, show, Million Dollar Quartet, coming up with the TH. And then, of course, the return of Harlem Globetrotters. So um, that was a lot. I talked really fast, and I hope you got it all. But I know it's been a long night for all of you, as it has been for me. But a lot of great information in here. I'm very proud and excited um, to be the leader of Five Legs. Great, thank you very much, Aaron. It's exciting, there's a lot of exciting news. Um, it's a difficult time to be doing what you're doing, so the fact that you have been able to pull this off in the way that you have has been great, so I really appreciate the information. Questions and discussion? Yeah, Mr. Resnick, well, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to say I, I'm, I'm thrilled to see enthusiastic uh, enthusiastic professionalism uh, in you, embodied by you and your group of uh, and your team. So that's exciting, and you know you know what's coming. Uh, some more some more great things, and I, I just feel like um, we're really on the right path with what you're doing and your uh, the great attitude and the can do that you have with your team. So. Uh, let's just keep that up, and, and congratulations so far, and let, let's move Five Flags forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Farber. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I have at least a few of those tonight. Yeah, this is really exciting, Aaron. You know, it's, it's, uh, we, we've talked so many years about Five Flags and what's going to happen and what are we going to do. We made that decision, so we're moving forward. Um, I do look forward to, to seeing what you come with uh, in hand for the budget process this year and the ways we're going to discuss that. I know that's going to be a long discussion as we, as we talk about some of those things, but at the same time, um, I know you're working on staffing like everybody else is. It's something we're working on too, and, and we hope that we're able to kind of get that in line. It's great to see that you've, you've been able to fill your management positions in this way. I think, that's, I think you're right. That's a, a big move in the right direction, and it looks like you've got a great team to really take you to the next phase here, so that's great. We're ready. Yeah, good. Yeah, we're excited to see it. Well, thank you very much again for sticking around, being with us for this great presentation, great information. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right. All right, well, the motion there was to receive and file. Here that presentation. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7-0. Action item number three is lead service line replacement program. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and approve. Second. Motion by Roussel, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. At budget adoption, the city contemplated a total of $32.2 million in lead service line projects to benefit 3,300 homes in low income Dubuque neighborhoods. At that time, loans issued by the Iowa Finance Authority under the Drinking Water SRF, Federal Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Program, for such projects were thought to be 90% forgivable, resulting in $3.2 million in permanent financing for the city. A summary of rates, projects, coverage, and cash projected at that time through the fiscal year 2024 City of Dubuque budget process is provided below. Recently, the city has been informed by the state of Iowa that the amount of loan forgiveness has been reduced from 90% to 49%. To reduce the chance of the rate increasing more than 5% in fiscal year 25, 
the city could fund lead service line replacements for 575 homes instead of 3,300 homes and a total amount of $5.7 million, including a city share of $3.2 million. The engineering cost of $616,000 is not eligible for loan forgiveness. The project would be broken into three phases over three years with final completion of all 575 homes by December of 2026. Each phase of approximately 195 homes will be separate applications by the city and there is no guarantee of any approvals from the state. While I am not recommending this course of action, the city council could stay with the original plan of 3,300 homes. Rather than reduce the scale of the project, the city could revise user rates to fund the increased debt service costs that re result from reduced debt forgiveness. The city instead chooses to keep the original 3,300 home scope of the project. Rates will need to increase to, approx to accommodate $17.5 million in permanent debt resulting in an additional 3% rate increase in fiscal year 25. The City of Dubuque has a combined 5,756 lead service lines, 2,451 service lines for full replacement, and 3,305 service lines for partial replacement, serving properties throughout the community. The Iowa Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund program administers the lead service line replacement fund available through the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. This funding provides an opportunity to replace lead service lines that are in low-income neighborhoods with the federal government for giving 49% of the money borrowed by the city. While these lead service lines do not generally present a health hazard because the city treats water with phosphates to coat the pipes, it is in the best interest of the community to take advantage of this forgivable loan program to eliminate some lead service lines. I respectfully recommend Mayor and City Council approval to apply for this program in three phases to complete replacement of lead service lines in 575 homes. This will maintain the fiscal year 2025 budget projection of a 5% water rate increase. Other factors might impact this rate increase, but that would be determined through the fiscal year 2025 budget pro process conducted in April of 2024. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? It's disappointing that we that we can't do more, but it also is, I mean, it's a unique opportunity that hasn't really come along before to be able to do any. And that's the challenge that we're that we have here. And it's unfortunate that we aren't able to find more federal money to put towards this, but we aren't. And that's the that's the challenge that we sit with right now. Ms. Roussel, sorry, I saw your hand. Just wanted to state that I, I support replacing just the 575 lines rather than the 3,300 as originally planned since it's in line with the reduced funding. I think utility rate increases are a huge challenge to those on limited budget, and we should do whatever we can to keep those costs in line. Thank you, Ms. Roussel. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Farber. Um, I'm also curious, you know, we had had a previous conversation about um, utilization and whether or not homes would really step up for this project as well in this program. So I think it'll be interesting um, going forward to get uh, feedback and, and examples of, of if indeed we do fulfill the 575 homes to begin with in this project. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, that's an excellent point because this is a voluntary program. So we'll ask people to apply and then we'll see how many people do apply. Um, and then uh, I would like to do one reminder, I like to do this commercial as often as possible, that the city does offer a 50% uh, base rate uh, decrease for low income people in our community. And we do our best to market it. We put it on every bill because we would like every low income person to take advantage of it, but we know they don't. So we continue to try and get that word out. Thank you for that reminder. Yeah. Ms. Wethel, go ahead. I think my question was a bit in line with um, Ms. Farber's, which is how do we, I don't want to say advertise, but is it the idea to put it into our billing, um, you know, send out billing? How are we going to get recruit people, if you will? 
Well, it's a credit to Chris Lester in our water department, but we know who all these people are. So we'll just do direct mailings to the people in the uh, eligible census tracts and say, you're eligible and would you like to apply for this program? Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> they were busy high-fiving in the back there. So yes, that, that's a, that is a high-five in agreement, yep. Thank you, I think that, that work is perfect. I'm, I'm excited for, for people in, in my ward to have that ability to reach out and be aware of, of it directly. Thank you, thank you. All right. Well, thank you for putting this work together and making this recommendation. I, too, agree with it. I think it's the, the right way to go right now, considering the situation that we're in and the resources at our disposal. So I'm looking forward to, as Ms. Farber points out, the utilization, seeing who we're able to actually impact with this. So this will be great. All right. Motion here is to receive and file and approve this recommendation. Um, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number four is community development, pardon me, community development block grant sub, <laughs> sub recipient late. agreement Catholic Charities. Ecumenical Tower Elevator Replacement. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Motion by Roussel, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approve the attached Community Development Block Grant subrecipient sub -recipient agreement to assist Catholic Charities for an additional $245,000 for the replacement of two elevators and ecumenical tower and authorize the mayor to execute the agreement on behalf of the city. On Wednesday, August 16th, Catholic Charities requested to the Community Development Advisory Commission an additional $245,000 to the already approved $135,000 in CDBG funds to assist with the construction cost of a complete renovation and modernization of the two elevators and ecumenical tower. The Community Development Advisory Commission approved the additional funding totaling $380,000. The $380,000 will be funded in the CDBG's annual action plan, fiscal year 24 amendment number one using reallocated dollars. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Did you have a Actually, I didn't, so Mike didn't know, but um, we had the organizations try to stay to do some public input, but they weren't able to, so I'd sure. just like to read it if that's okay. Absolutely. Please. Okay, perfect. So uh, Tracy Morris, I'm the executive director at Catholic Charities, um, she said she's that um, I'd like to thank the mayor and city council for the review and consideration of our CDBG funding request for inclusion in the CDBG annual action plan. Our request is to completely renovate and modernize uh, two elevators at the Ecumenical Tower. It is an 88-unit independent living community for seniors and disabled adults located right across the street from here. Ecumenical Tower was built in 1974, and the elevators are original to the building and have far exceeded their useful life. Uh, they have an increasing number of issues for both elevators, and the renovation project is significant expense for a nonprofit organization. Uh, we believe the city of priorities align closely with our priorities to support neighborhood development and improvements, and with your partnership, we will be able to assure that affordable quality, accessible housing for special needs populations will remain in the downtown area. 72% of the current residents at Ecumenical Medical Tower are extremely low income, meaning they live on 19,500 or less annually. CDPG funding will allow us to continue to keep our rents affordable. We're so thankful for your consideration of the project, and she was going to introduce, she had two residents here tonight. Um, CC is in apartment 510 over at Ecumenical Towers. And she said, I'm a resident at Ecumenical Tower for nearly five years, and in my first year, I experienced challenges with one of the elevators. It was quite a scary experience for me and my service dog. I was quickly helped out, thankfully. During the five years I've lived there, the elevators are breaking down more frequently and are out of order, and elevator repairmen are, more fre are there more frequently. It's stressful to wait 10 minutes for an elevator if one's broken down, and I have missed the bus on occasion. The elevator is a necessity for me because I rely on a mobility device for getting around. 
I don't have the option of using the stairs. It's becoming a common occurrence that the elevators are out of order. I've also witnessed others who have experienced challenges with the elevators, and it's an emotional experience, and some residents are afraid to use the elevator now. Thanks for your consideration of the application. And then we had Brooklyn Williams, um, and she said, I have spinal and orthopedic issues with hamper myability, and I walk with a cane. I moved in January 1st and experienced many times the elevators have had issues. I have almost missed appointments because the elevators are out of order and using the stairs is quite painful. It's also scary when the elevator is not running smoothly and afraid to be stuck in there. The doors at times shut prematurely and it's painful when they are shut on you. I've had to help other residents with the elevator even when I am in pain, so there's a huge necessity for elevators. It's not a luxury, it's a need for independence and mobility. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis, that's very helpful. Appreciate that. Any discussion or questions? Ms. Wethel. Alexis, you did a great job, but CC and Brooklyn are incredible advocates, and I'm sorry they um, aren't here to share their story in person, but um, this is really important to them. It's important that um, we provide services in this way, and so I'm so grateful that we were able to do this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wethel. All right, well, the motion here is to receive and file and adopt this resolution. So, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. And pass the 7 0. Action item number five is community development block grant. Subrecipient Agreement, Dubuque Community Schools, Lincoln Outdoor Wellness. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. I got a motion by Farber, second by Resnick. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Stager is recommending City Council approve the attached CDBG subrecipient <laughs> agreement to the Butte Community School District with a project budget of $474,431 for a complete site redesign at Lincoln Elementary School to improve the use of space in a low to moderate area and authorize the mayor to execute the agreement on behalf of the city. The Lincoln Outdoor Wellness Project is a joint effort of the Butte Community Schools Administration, Lincoln Elementary Schools Administration, Lincoln's parent guardian group, PALS, and City Dubuque housing staff. The Lincoln Playground is a highly utilized neighborhood destination during the school day and outside of school hours. During the school day, it is used for recess and physical education. Outside of school hours, it is used by on-site before and after school programs and a very popular public playground for children and families. This project includes a complete site redesign to improve the use of space, replacing play equipment with greater accessibility as a focus, providing at grade sensory activities, adding a walking jogging path, removing unnecessary paved space, eliminating regular vehicle access, and increasing shade around the play structures. These components support safety, health, and overall well-being for children and families. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion or questions? Is there any input for this one, Alexis? Okay, thank you. All right. Nice to have some Lincoln representation here earlier, so they were able to say a little bit about some of the things that they do there. Okay, I think it's a worthy cause. Well, the motion here is to receive and file, adopt this resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? <clears throat> Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number six is community development block grant subrecipient agreement Mount Pleasant Home ADA bathroom. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Motion by Resnick, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Stager is recommending City Council approve the attached CDBG subrecipient agreement to assist Mount Pleasant Home to remodel an existing bathroom to be ADA compliant with a project budget of $18,000 and authorize the mayor to execute the agreement on behalf of the city. On Wednesday, July 19th, Mount Pleasant Homes requested to the Community Development Advisory Commission 
$14,000 of CDBG funds to assist with the remodel of an existing men's bathroom to be ADA compliant. The Community Development Advisory Commission approved additional funding totaling $18,000. The $18,000 will be funded in CDBG's annual action plan, fiscal year 24 amendment number one using reallocated dollars. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Alexis, you got yes, some more Yes, I do have input yeah. from, um, on behalf of Keith, the administrator for the past 33 years at Mount Pleasant Home. Um, Karen Zexer was also here working as a volunteer board member. Um, we are in great need of updating our common bathroom in one wing so that's ADA compliant and safer for our aging community who often have walkers, canes, and sometimes wheelchairs. At Mount Pleasant Home, most residents use shared bathrooms that are down the hall. This particular bathroom was first constructed in 1939. It has been on our list of necessary upgrades for a, a long while. Within our unique community, they need, <clears throat> they need first the safety net of affordability, which leads to our turning in our grants. Uh, we are committed to keeping costs down and not passing them on through grant writing, food purchasing from food banks, Eagle Scout projects, and the like. Our rooms start at just over 1000 a month for all meals, rent, cleaning, laundry activities, and some chauffeuring. Uh, Mount Pleasant Homes has a mission essential to who we are to help sustain the health and well-being of our diverse residents to live with dignity, pride, and self-respect as they care for themselves and others. What becomes challenging for us in today's world is that more and more individuals come to us with brain health issues. Elders and those on the margins have experienced considerable isolation. People who isolate often don't thrive. Because Mount Pleasant is homes is structured as it is, connecting people with common meals and common living spaces they do and can thrive. They experience belonging and friendship. They are connected. Mount Pleasant becomes home and family to many. Our request for this grant will fill a great need for their, these individuals' lives. Their existence is humble and simple. Mount Pleasant is a humble dwelling that welcomes everyone to live better through, together without worry over food, a roof, finances, or an unwelcoming bathroom. We thank you for your support for Mount Pleasant Home and welcome you to visit anytime. Thank you very much. Thanks for sticking around to be able to share those with us. That's, that's helpful to have that information. You know, in my time at Loris, I actually had um, some great opportunities to be able to spend time at Mount Pleasant Home. And they, it's a great community, but the biggest challenge they have is the building itself is it's very, very old. And it's, it's tough to turn into a space that they need um, physically uh, that is ADA compliant in that way. So I think this is really helpful for us to be able to do this. Yes. All right. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. I just wanted to mention that uh, it is a very friendly place, and uh, several of us uh, have been there. I, but ironically, it was, you know, it's an older place. It used to be called, the name of the place was Home for the Friendless. Mm -hmm. And then they changed it to Mount Pleasant Home, which I think was a good idea. <laughs> and it is, a, it is a friendly place. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you. All right, motion here is to receive and file, adopt that resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number seven is request for work session Black Heritage Survey update. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Roussel? I move to receive and file and set the work session for Monday, October 16th at 6 p.m. Second by Sprank. Motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. Right before a regular meeting, I believe, correct? No. Yeah. All right. And Trish, would you call the roll, please? Apple is absent. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Action item number eight is new housing project update, September 2023 video and handout. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and watch the video. Second. Motion by Resnick, second by Jones. We can roll the video, please, Eric.
It's just one video, right? Because mm -hmm. I messed that up a lot. <laughs> Great. Wow. It's, I'm really glad that the Public Information Office did that one. It's really nice to be able to see things with our own eyes that, uh, you know, numbers on a page are fun to look at sometimes, but uh, to be able to actually see places going up like that is very, very helpful. So exciting stuff happening with housing in Dubuque. All right. Motion there is to receive a file. Watch that video. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next on the agenda uh, is uh, council member reports. All right. Reports from anybody tonight? Mr. Resnick? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would like to. Uh, this is all I can think of since I heard the news of our uh, one of our colleagues uh, passing away. Joyce Connors was an outstanding uh, colleague, and the longer I knew her, uh, the more I appreciated what she brought to this group. And uh, she was very patient with us uh, youngsters as we got on, and, and she helped us quite a bit. And uh, she, I, I've got, I've read a lot. Um, on, on Facebook and from others that I don't know, but attested the same things that I knew about her uh, to be very patient, kind, intelligent, a hard worker. Um, even after she uh, retired after 16 years on the council, she was willing to come back uh, and help us out in a time of need. She put herself forward uh, to come and help out the council when we had a temporary um, we had a temporary vacancy. But I, I just want to say, I think it was very appropriate tonight that uh, we, um, as a council, voted unanimously for uh, Mary Zinn because Joyce Connors uh, provided unplanned pregnancy counseling uh, as a profession. And I, I know that she would absolutely be here uh, for uh, advocating for this group. And of course, I, I thought of her, you know, as soon as I knew this was coming up. So I, I'm sure there's others who uh, can and can speak to her. But I, I just remember the endless stories about her meeting with people in her uh, in her ward about the B branch and what a massive program that was going to be. And you know, a massive change means there's massive questions and. Uh, and uh, worrying about what what could uh, what could be the problems, and she was there all along, uh, a steady hand uh, on the till, and always approachable, and understood why you might be excited and 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 have a negative attitude about, you know, taking whole swaths of your neighborhood, uh, but as you know, she was very proud of that way the city staff uh, uh, completed the B branch so far, and we're, we're still working on it. But you know that uh, wonderful linear linear park that we have, a lot of people out there uh, talking to each other now. It's just a, a, fan th a fantastic thing. When my wife and I go down there biking on her tandem, I often think of Joyce and the, all the stories that she told about how she worked with people and uh, assured and reassured that this was going to be something great because the city of Dubuque and the citizens made it important and made it work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. So I also share the heartfelt appreciation for all that Joyce did for the city and uh, what a mentor she was to me uh, as I was uh, determining uh, my approach to city council. And she always had a smile. She always had a positive comment. Uh, and she was a great guiding light. And how fortunate the city was to have her guidance over that 16-year period. And even over the last couple of years, we would see her at all these events. Um, and she would be there smiling with her husband, Tom, and just really going on and networking like, you know, nobody's business and appeared to be everybody's best friend. So it is... Um, I adored her, and I'm just really sorry for her loss, and, and much appreciation to her family for the, for um, for her and her great memory, and hopefully it's a memory we can all cherish. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones, go ahead. I think quite a few of us sitting here were encouraged by her to sit here, mm -hmm. or, or to try to, and uh, I sure appreciated that. She made my coming on the council easier and more comfortable. Um, 
I always looked at Joyce as a, as a barometer. If she was starting to boil over, it's probably time for you to get mad and boil over a little bit. Because <laughs> it didn't happen very often, but it always happened when it was right. And uh, she, was, she was just so full of common sense and practicality, um, things that I sometimes reach for and miss. Um, but she did it all the time. She could always see the, the forest for the trees no matter what. And uh, I'm sure going to miss her. Yeah, um, Joyce was instrumental in helping me to decide to run for city council. She asked me twice, actually. <laughs> so here I am. Um, just amazing council that I could le lean on when I had questions the first couple of years because she had 16 years of experience. And, um, and but then at, towards the end, she's like, you don't need my council. You know what you're doing. So, but... <laughs> Just, I will truly miss her because she was just such a remarkable woman. Tom and her at events. The, our heart goes out to Jill as well on the, on, since she's city staff. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'm going to miss a lot of her. So thank you. And yourself. It's just amazing how many of us had the same experience with Joyce. Um, you know, you're always so lucky when someone comes through your life that can lift you up and lead you to be the person that you didn't know you could be and that cheerleader person that you could call on your worst day and just say, I don't think I can do this. And she'd say, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And so I just say thanks to, their, to the family for sharing Joyce with us for so many years and we will all miss her terribly. She was a wonderful lady. Go ahead, Zoe. I'm going to take the cheerleader and run with it, too, because I um, just in probably the last six weeks, I ran into Joyce a couple times. And both times I left the conversation thinking, well, I must be doing OK if she thinks I'm doing OK. <laughs> she just always had this way of making you feel like you were lifted up after you visited with her. Um, just her very common sense, wise, but enthusiastic passion for our city and the people that serve our city. So she'll be so missed. Well, I'm going to take a, a bit of a twist on what, and I know you're all going to get it because you knew Joyce very well. But uh, my first call with her, she put me through the ringer. <laughs> when, I, when I said I wanted to run for council, she, I mean, she... She tested me out for a little while and made sure that I was, that my heart was in the right place to make sure that this was something that I, that was going to be good for the city of Dubuque. And I remember that very well. And it was, a, it was a wonderful call. And every interaction that I ever had with her was just a wonderful interaction. And I, you know, when I think of the type of person that I think, I, I think I can tell that we want to be as council members, it is Joyce Connors that we use as an example. And I, and I know that, uh, that we, we see her as that person that um, she truly was a mentor to each and every one of us and um, left such a legacy for us to, to use as an example as we continue to move forward. So um, I really, I always appreciated her counsel. I always appreciated being able to talk to her and having a, a conversation that I, I know would be would be very honest and very forthright. And you know, if you wanted a true opinion and somebody who was gonna give it to you straight, you called Joyce, and I always appreciate that about her. It's pretty clear we're all going to miss her very much. I know that that is true for city staff as well. They've spent a lot of great, great years with her. So we are definitely thinking of her entire family. Well, thank you for that. That was, that was a nice moment at the end of a long night. Um, not quite the end of a long night, because we do have a closed session. So I'll take a motion for that, please. Mayor. Mr. Jones. It was the City Council going to close session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 to discuss pending litigation and potential real estate purchases or sale. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. For the record, the attorney the City Council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in closed session is City Attorney Krenner Brumwell. Um, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session.